good evening, everyone. Good evening. I'd love to begin the meeting. All right, I would like to call this meeting to order. Thank you. Mrs. Richards, may I have the roll call, please? Yes, President Anderson, let the record show that all five board members are present this evening. Wonderful, thank you. Please join me in a moment of silence, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, I motion to approve tonight's agenda. Second. Oh, um, I heard Anna first. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye, motion carries five to zero. Next on the agenda is the superintendent's report with Mrs. Richards. Thank you, President Anderson, members of the board. It's another session or segment of Higley Adventures. All right, you're all invited to the Fine Arts Festival this Saturday, April 6th, at Williamsfield High School from 9 to noon. This is an exciting event, and it's free. You will get to experience music, art, dance, and creativity, showcasing the talents of our students and local artists. Please come enjoy the live performances admire artwork, and of course, indulge in the delicious food that will be there for you. We hope to see you all there. And a special shout out to Mr. Lotzenheiser and his Fine Arts Festival team. Thank you. All right, this is an exciting thing. Today, we're so proud to share with you that Higley High's 11th grade student, Olivia Duarte, and her Hopi mug ceramic work was recently showcased at the National K-12 Exhibition at the National Council of Education for the Ceramic Arts in Richmond, Virginia. Because of Olivia's exceptional talent, and creativity. She was an awarded a prestigious scholarship worth $100,000 from the Kansas City Art Institute and also received $2,500 to attend their pre-college summer program, which she'll attend in June and earn three college credits at completion. Olivia's accomplishments here highlight the importance of nurturing young talent in the arts and inspires others to pursue, pursue their artistic passions. Congratulations on this wonderful achievement. And Olivia, if you're here, will you stand up? Next, we have Allison Manon. She is a Flynn Scholar. This is amazing. More than 1,000 Arizona high school seniors applied in the fall for this chance of earning this 2024 Flynn Scholarship and a full ride to an Arizona public university. Today, we are thrilled to announce that Williamsville Senior Allison was named a Flynn Scholar. This is the first time ever in Williamsfield High School's history. 
the 39th class of Flynn Scholars will receive funding for tuition, housing, meals, and of course, study abroad. A value of more than $130,000. That is an incredible achievement. Allison impressed interviewers not only with her academic excellence, but her leadership and her dedication to the community. As you can see from her pictures, she's been on a path to success from a very early age. Although she can't be here tonight because she's attending a Flynn Scholar reception, we want to let her know that we are proud of her achievement and wish her the best. <laughs> Mr. Lotzenheiser, can you take this? President Anderson, members of the board, it's with great pleasure that I would like to introduce the dynamic duo of administrators from Sossaman Middle School, <laughs> Mr. Potts and Mr. Keeling, to talk about an undefeated championship we had at Sossaman Middle School. You want this? Mr. Keeling does. <laughs> I feel a lot of pressure to be dynamic now, and I'm sorry to let you guys down. It's not going to happen. Awesome. Uh, Mr. Potts and I are not the stars of the show. Our coaches are and our players are, so I'd like to invite them up as we say great things about them. Coach Flores, Coach D, ladies, come on up. So the Sossman basketball program has been achieving great things over the past few years. In the last three years, we've played in the championship at the seventh or eighth grade level every single year. And so it's been a great, great thing that Coach Flores and Coach D have been building. Um, what's unique about this group and, and that uh, Mr. Lotzenheiser mentioned is they did it in an undefeated fashion. They won every single game. They played so hard every minute. And I want to say a huge congratulations to our girls and to our coaches. Let's see that banner. All right, so Coach and I are really excited for the next season and so going on forward and hopefully to get the eighth grade one back and keep the seventh grade one from here on out. Yeah. Thank you so much for being here. President Anderson, members of the board, we're ready for points of pride. I would like Christine Hansen and Terry Pepper to come forward. These are your administrators from Chaparral Elementary School. Okay, good, neat, good evening, everybody. I'm Christine Hansen, proud principal of what we like to call the Shark Tank. And it is my pleasure 
to be here this evening to recognize some very important people from our Shark Tank. Hey, my name is Terry Pepper. I'm the assistant principal at Chaparral. We're very excited. Uh, we have some amazing people all over our campus, but uh, tonight we get to highlight a few of the exceptional ones. All right, so we're actually going to kick it off with our certified staff member, Mrs. Wendy Towery Stowe. Please come forward. <laughs> a long walk up here. Thank you. Come on over. You got to stand up here. All right. So Mrs. Stove is currently our, our math instructional coach at Chaparral. We're very fortunate to have her. Not all schools have a math coach. Um, but Wendy Stove is recognized as our Chaparral Points of Pride certified staff member for her wide range of contributions to both Chaparral and Higley Unified. Wendy is our Title I math instructional coach, and you will never meet anyone more passionate about empowering students, teachers, and educational leadership in their mathematical understanding. Wendy has been an integral leader in professional learning, collaborating to develop professional learning presentations for Chaparral, for Higley District, and educator groups across the state of Arizona. Wendy also serves as a facilitator of our Crazy Eights and Math Think Tank student action teams, as well as our Achieve Goals staff action team. She has brought new research-based practices to our school that have re-energized a love for mathematics and a love for learning mathematics with both educators and our students. We truly value and appreciate you, Mrs. Stove. Mm -hmm. And do we want to introduce who you who you have here supporting in the back. So my Shap family is here. Thank you guys so much. Um, my sons are both in college, so um, I'm broken flying solo tonight. And uh, my husband unfortunately had to work, but I do appreciate all my lovely colleagues back there who came to cheer me on. Yeah. Thank you. All right, and I have the pleasure of recognizing our classified uh, Points of Pride recipient, and it is Miss Yvette Meyer. Come on down, Miss Meyer. <laughs> All right, so Miss Meyer is our, our being recognized as our Points of Pride classified staff member for her invaluable contributions to our campus. She serves as a resource para-educator and crossing guard. Um, she ensures a safe and supportive environment for all students. Um, on many occasions, you'll hear her wishing people good morning over the radio and starting off our days on just a super positive note. Um, her active involvement with her leadership environment action team showcases her commitment to enhancing our community and her collaborative spirit and win-win attitude further distinguishes her as a vital asset to the Shark Tank. Um, she gives her all no matter what um, or where she is on campus, and she does it with a smile. We really, truly value and appreciate Ms. Meyer for everything that she does. She's amazing. All right, Ms. Meyer, who did you bring tonight? I brought my husband, Randy, and my son, Sebastian, and my shark family. <laughs> All right, next I would like to recognize our student points of pride, Miss Rosie Whitmore, please come forward. All right, this young lady, I could go on forever, but I will stick to the script. We are celebrating Rosie Whitmer as our Chaparral Points of Pride student. Rosie can always be seen modeling the seven habits and is well known for exhibiting habit eight, find your voice. She is a member of our Leader in Me student lighthouse team and has impressively recruited business partners while shopping at Costco. <laughs> and incoming kindergarten students at our Meet the Teacher, Meet the Principal breakfast, excuse me. 
Her active involvement also extends to providing school tours. She quickly built an impressive reputation with Cooley Early Childhood Development Center, where she proudly showcased our Shark Tank initiatives, and that is a very sweet story for another time. Uh, Rosie's leadership and effective communication exemplify her as an exceptional student and a value con valuable contributor to our school community. And we are so proud of you, Miss Rosie Whitmer. Congratulations. All right, Miss Rosie, who did you bring this evening? I brought my mom, my dad, and truly my sister. Awesome. All right, and last but certainly not least, um, it's my honor to recognize our parent volunteer points of pride recipient, and it's Miss Mindy Beverly. Come on down, Mindy. Um, we're honoring her tonight for her just exceptional contributions to our community, our school community. Um, she's a dedicated parent on our campus. She actively engages in our PTO. Um, she goes above and beyond facilitating our masterpieces classes. Uh, classes. Her efforts um, have been not only enhanced our educational experience, but also significantly increased our parent involvement in classrooms. Um, she consistently goes the extra mile um, crafting handmade corsages for our family, for our first family dance, um, offering beautiful face painting at our fall spectacular, um, and creating an inviting winter wonderland holiday shop. Um, her creativity and dedication makes these events extra special and leaves a lasting positive impact on our community. Thank you so much, Ms. Beverly. And who did, and who did you bring tonight? Okay, so tonight I brought my husband, Stephen, my children, Kylie, Katie, and little Stephen. And my mom, Dr. Terry Bingham, and my dad are here too. And that's who I brought. Oh, and my shark family. Thank you, Shark family. Now, President Anderson, I think there's some coyotes in the house. All right. Mr. Jeff Armstrong. Crap, how'd you get up there? You're fast. You are like a ninja. I'm going to be your assistant. Oh, thank you. Appreciate that. All right, good evening, President Anderson, members of the board, cabinet. I thank you guys for giving me the mic for the next 45 minutes. <laughs> they told me I have to stick to the script because I don't like talking. All right, we're going to start off. I'm, my name is Jeff Armstrong, proud principal at Coronado Elementary, the Coyote Nation. And at Coronado, we have a real strong belief in that core belief of ours is we are one. We're one staff, one school, one community. And each individual that is going to be honored tonight embodies that in some way, shape, or form. And I'm super excited. I told you for 45 minutes, so bring your, get your popcorn ready. We're going to start off with our certified staff member, Mrs. Jenna Brandenburg. Those of you that don't know Jenna, she is by far 
one of the strongest educators in the state and this district and that any child's parent can ask for. Jenna serves as our gate specialist. She is not unheard to see her in a classroom assisting students, assisting teachers. Unfortunately, we had a teacher that had to resign. And for an entire quarter, Mrs. Brandenburg stepped in as being the teacher. And when I was interviewing, she told me, Armstrong, you do not get me out of the classroom until you find the right person to teach these kids. I don't want them to lose what I'm giving them. We did find the right teacher, and she was able to get out. But she went back, and she started doing her job. And if you want to talk about an educator who cares deeply not only about kids, but as well as growing other, other teachers or educators in a not official leader title position, that is Jenna Brandenburg. So give her a huge round of applause. I brought with me my husband, my daughter, and amazing Coronado Coyotes. All right. We're going to recognize the class, classified staff member, and that is Mrs. Tammy Overton. <laughs> Behind every great administrator is an even better office manager. <laughs> and that is Tammy. You want to talk about someone who cares deeply about people for being a person, you are witnessing one of the strongest and the best individuals being honored tonight. It is Tammy will be there early. She will help out whoever, whenever. If it's a family that needs assistance, she drops what she's doing and she runs straight out to assist. It is incredible. In fact, tonight, a parent said, you have to read this and handed me a handwritten note from one of our Coronado parents. Tammy embodies the spirit of Coronado Elementary. She is warm, welcoming, enthusiastic, and encouraging to all. Her positive energy, which feeds into everyone around her, is exactly what we want our children to experience when they walk through the doors of the school. She makes every parent and guardian feel a great level of comfort dropping our child, our child into Coronado's care each and every day. That is the epitome of what Miss Tammy stands for. Give her a huge round of applause. Oh. I brought my wonderful husband, Don, and my son, Aiden, and besties, and my wonderful Coronado family. All right. We're going to recognize our parent volunteer, and that is the amazing Mrs. Kristen Furneaux. Come on down. <laughs> now, Mrs. Furneaux, one amazing parent. I will tell you, it is it, when you walk into the building, you will probably see Mrs. Furneaux carrying two jugs of milk and some half and half to put into our staff's refrigerator so they have it for their coffee. She goes above and beyond. Mrs. Furneaux is also serves on our PTO and is in charge of hosting many of our events. She is there early. She helps us in any way. And it's, it's amazing to have this kind of PTO, but it's the, she is the voice to ensure that whatever we do impacts kids and the school as a whole. And I'm telling you, Coronado is lucky to have Mrs. Furneaux and her wonderful family. She has a very stressful job. I will say that. What she does, at, does as a career, it's stressful. But she still finds time to assist Coronado and Higley Unified as a whole in everyday work. So we thank you very much, Ms. Furneaux. I brought my husband, Bob, and my two boys, Hudson and Grady who love Coronado. All right. The best for last, the reason why schools exist, and that is our students. And I'm going to recognize Miss Cambria Godfrey. Come on up. <laughs> Mrs. Godfrey is one amazing sixth grader. 
She serves as our, our student council's vice president. It is seen every day, the leadership that this young lady possesses. Be ready. She's, she'll be president one day. Watch. <laughs> she will help out any staff, student, throughout the day. When she's not doing that, she's reciting lines for our next play. And if she's not doing that, she's taking her time studying or reading while she's walking through the halls. But everyone knows who Miss Godfrey is, and everyone knows how much she cares and loves Coronado and the students and the staff that are attending that campus. So we are so, so proud to have you representing Coronado in your future endeavors. Great job. I brought my mom and my dad. That's it, right? Do you want me to recognize anyone else? I can't. My time's up. Okay. Thank you, everyone, and congratulations, and thank you for your service and dedication. Students, congratulations on um, being just great and above and beyond. But if you would like to go home, you're, this is a great time to get up and go. Um, you're welcome to stay. We're just saying if you'd like to go, you're welcome to go. Thank you. President Anders, Anderson, members of the board. We're excited to report some upcoming events. Friday, April 5th, is our Higley High School visit. We hope you can join us for that. Like we mentioned before, the Fine Arts Festival is this Saturday at Williamsfield High School. Our board retreat is scheduled for April 17th, and it's a work-study session here in the boardroom. And finally, we have our Teacher of the Year ceremony scheduled for Thursday, April 25th at the HCPA at 4.30. And I can tell you for sure, you have some amazing teachers. We got to listen to their stories and their lessons, and I couldn't be any prouder. Thank you, Ms. Richards. Okay, uh, next are public comments. We value input from our constituents. This time on our agenda has been set aside for anyone from the audience who wishes to address the board. Those that wish to speak should have filled out a speaker card 
which is due prior to the start of our meeting. Members of the board may not discuss, comment, or take action on matters raised that are not specifically identified on the agenda. Therefore, pursuant to ARS 38-431.01, action taken as a result of public comment will be limited to directing staff to study the matter, responding to any criticism, or scheduling the matter for further consideration and decision at a later date. Also, we ask that the audience members practice proper public meeting decorum, refraining from either negative or positive responses, including clapping or verbal outbursts, to ensure fairness to all points of view. Those that refuse to follow these rules may be asked to leave. In accordance with policy BEDH, public participation at board meetings, if considered necessary, the governing board president shall set a time limit on the length of the comment period. In order to ensure that each individual has an opportunity to address the board, the president may also set a time limit for individual speakers. Thank you for your cooperation. All right, first we will hear from Jill Wilson. Now is it on? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Dear Governing Board and Cabinet, my name is Jill Wilson. I'm currently a parent at Williamsfield High School, or currently a parent of a Williamsfield High School student. I've sat in this boardroom for nine years. Probably, uh, I'm looking around. Mrs. Reese might be the one who has longer time than I do. I think. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I've sat here for nine years watching these meetings. I don't say that to be boastful. I say it to show how committed I've been and involved in this district. Today, I ask that you start thinking about our professional development mornings that we are doing at our high schools. They're 20 minutes long. Our teachers don't have enough time to do meaningful work in that 20 minutes. Professional development is not working for our staff, students, or administration. They need more time for professional development, and 20 minutes isn't cutting it. I've heard from teachers that it's not long enough to get any real work done, and especially when students are in and out of their classroom and meeting spaces. As a parent, I know it's very difficult to decide if today is a late start or early release day, and you're trying to figure that out in the morning on Wednesdays. Uh, I am concerned about the parents who are letting their child ride a bus and the liability that is opening our district up for letting students on campus and not being supervised. I personally believe in professional development and I want our teachers to have this. I just want it to be meaningful and that they're able to get it uninterrupted. I ask that you make the switch quickly as possible and for next school year so our students and admin and teachers have time and meaningful time. Thank you. Thank you. Next we'll hear from Marty Bender. Um, good evening. I'm here to ask the board to help the district avoid what would be a worst case scenario this November. That is putting both a bond and an override extension on the ballot in November and having them both fail. I want you to reject the, re the Citizens Committee recommendation coming and only put an MNO override on the ballot. The avoidance of the worst case scenario here financially is your duty and your duty alone. The failure of the finance team in not stressing this worst case scenario enough during the committee meetings led to the recommendation you're gonna receive. And I'm asking you to execute on one of your main duties that is helping to ensure the financial health of the district. Let me share with you what I heard as a committee member and why I voted for an MNO override extension only. First, we got a demographic survey. And what that survey showed us is that our K through six enrollment has already peaked and has started to decline. Our middle school and high school enrollment will peak within the next few years and subsequently start to decline. We also learned that our elementary school usage in six of our nine elementaries is below 70% capacity. In two of the six, they're at 49 and 55%. We have a ton of wasted space in this district and wasted space is the biggest waste of money. 
We also paid $15,000 for a taxpayer survey. And what the survey was for was to get the attitude of taxpayers regarding overrides and bonds. And here's what we heard. They wanted money spent on really three main things. One is safety of students and staff. Two is maintenance of buildings to make sure they're safe to be in. And three is retention and pay for teachers to make sure they stay. What they didn't want money spent on was athletics and unnecessary infrastructure space. We also heard that the chance of a measure's, a measure's passage goes down if multiple measures are on the ballot. Finally, we heard about the bond spending plan. And just like in 2021 and 2022, the plans don't really match what the taxpayers are asking for. $12.3 million in the bond plan is for safety, security, and technology spending. Of that, about a million will go to security cameras. About 11 million will go towards laptops, networking, and infrastructure. $40.3 million of capital improvement projects. Of those, one and a half million goes to secure the front offices, while 17 million goes for athletics, including sand volleyball courts and competition gyms, and 22 million goes for infrastructure that we may not even need in the next few years. Did the team even listen to the taxpayers' responses to the survey? Tonight, only you can help ensure that the district avoids truly the worst case scenario. The bond fails, the override fails, and we're left with a bunch of excuses as to why we need to cut programs and staff. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Mary Ann P. Good evening. I come to you very concerned. When the primary bond holding companies stifle for schools has been historically gone after by the SEC. Since 2006, the federal SEC has taken Stifle to court at least four times. Back in 2006, Stifle was taken to court by the SEC for defrauding the five different school districts in the state of Wisconsin over $200 million. If this is the bond company that we are looking at floating the school bond through, if this bond gets passed, big if, then this is of a huge concern. On top of that, Stifle, through their Barclays holding, is also involved in the World Economic Forum. And this year, Stifle's president actually gave one of the speeches to the World Economic Forum. Is that really where we want our school district putting their money? If that doesn't make it any worse, Stifle has started a few years ago with a dye program. Since they started their dye program, every year on record, their employee retention has decreased by 2%. Their own employees are fleeing the company over their policies. If you doubt these comments, you could go to Glassdoor to research their employee confidence. You can find the actual SEC lawsuits against them on sec.gov, stocklaw.com, um, westlaw.com. So there's all this evidence. Another thing to be worried about is our new super and the fact that he wants to do all sorts of buildings 
but it appears that he is also kind of getting into bed with ADM out of Tempe who specializes in school gyms. Funny, our su new super is very comfortable with that company and we're looking to redo two school gyms. My time is up. I thank you for your time. Thank you. Next will be Valerie Marsh. I'm the director of Arizonans for Safe Technology. I hope you've had a chance to look at the information on the health effects of cell tower radiation, which I emailed you yesterday. Tricia asked me some very important questions to which I responded. However, your email system has been down all day, and those answers ought to be considered seriously before you make a final decision on whether to approve the cell tower. For the past seven years, I've been involved in public education on the health effects of pulsed modulated microwave radiation. This is a type of radiation that comes from wireless devices like cell phones and computers and the cell phone tower you are considering. Now, even though Verizon and other telcos will tell you that this is non-ionizing radiation so it's safe, I am showing you images right now that will prove otherwise. If you look at the top visual, you will see um, the yellow image on the left called control. That's a photo of a healthy DNA. In the middle photo, you can see damage caused by gamma rays, ionizing radiation. Now, that damage that you're looking at is the equivalent of 1,600 chest x-rays. But if you look to the right, you will see almost identical damage on a DNA from the supposedly non-ionizing radiation that is supposedly safe that Verizon will tell you is safe, but you can see for yourself that it is not. And that damage is from two hours of exposure to that radiation from a cell phone. The tower will emit radiation 24 seven, day in and day out. The bottom image called blood has a photo at the top of healthy red blood cells that are round and separated so they can fit through our tiny capillaries. If you look at the image right below titled carrying exposure, you will see that after 45 minutes of exposure, those blood cells clumped together in aggregates, aggregates that cannot move through our capillaries to deliver oxygen. If you turn the paper over, the top is an image of a healthy blood brain barrier but the middle image shows what happened after two hours of exposure to a relatively low level of radiation. Do you see those brown lesions? Not only were there lesions, but 2% of brain cells were damaged, there was genetic damage and memory impairment. The bottom photo is a close-up of those lesions, and if you look, you can see actual perforations in the blood-brain barrier. I could talk for hours about the documented health effects, including cancer, autism, cognitive issues, learning impairment, decreased fertility, sleep disruption, and a host of others. A cell tower placed dangerously close to the students and staff you are charged with protecting will also affect all of the neighbors in your vicinity. You will receive $24,000 per year, but you will be personally liable for damages from health effects. This radiation is proven to cause cancer. It costs $45,000 just for the first year of treatment for childhood leukemia, but the cost is so much more than financial. If I were you, I would not want to look at that cell tower every day and know that I was responsible for allowing it to be placed on my school. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next, we have Mindy Brocker. Thank you so much for giving me time to come and speak to you. Um, I missed last week because of spring break, but or last month, but I was able to catch it online. After that absolutely demoralizing meeting from last month, 
I wanted to speak up as a parent of public education students. The people who sit up here and try to save money on the backs of teacher pay are also the same people who will actively fight to dismantle our public education. They call teachers indoctrinators, accuse you of ulterior motives, they disrespect you and don't trust you, teachers, while gaslighting you and insisting that teacher pay is their priority. But I have to believe from the depths of my soul that these people are in the minority. They're a loud minority, kind of mean, pretty frustrating, but they are not the community at large. The large, large majority of us adore our children's teachers. We appreciate and respect the time, the tears, and the love that you give to our children. We also recognize that you are perpetually underpaid and under-resourced. We shouldn't have to make a choice between student supports and teacher pay. Truly, honestly, classroom resources are worthless without teachers to utilize those tools and help our students to succeed. To succeed. But I know talk is cheap, rent is expensive. So I want to say, I want to ask for a couple of things. I want to beg of other parents to make a difference in somebody's day, in a teacher's day. I'm a full-time employee. I'm a parent of three students. I don't have a lot of extra to give, but we can all do something. Pick something, do something. Next, please remind our governing board and your neighbors with and without children that teacher pay and public school supports are more vital this year than they have ever been. Please take some time to wade through conspiracy theories and politicking to know that it's important that we all need to step up when asked. And I will remind the board here in front of me that your words, they matter. Your actions, they matter. And our teachers absolutely deserve better. Thank you. Okay, next we have Kathleen Richards. Good evening, Governing Board and HUSD team. I wanted to take this opportunity to thank everyone involved for putting together the Citizens Committee that met um, over the last three months, especially Tyler and the finance team. They put together a lot of really excellent education for a group of individuals who don't see eye to eye on the state of funding in Arizona, let alone in our school district. Um, they were excellent about providing us the resources that we asked for and frankly in letting our team that had been assembled from the application process uh, go through that information and reach our own conclusions without any level of or attempt of influence based on whatever it is that they, I'm sure, and I know, think would be the best way for us to move forward. Um, the committee was not in total agreement in terms of moving forward with both the MNO and the bond, and I will say that I acknowledge that it is going to be a hard sell, and that is what we were told from the survey, from the company that conducted the survey that education was going to be the primary component and what has been lacking in so many of the failed bonds that we have seen both in our district and in surrounding districts. But as we learned on the committee uh, by touring both the oldest campus and some of the newest facilities that are available over at Higley High School, which were beautiful, by the way, you couldn't tell the walls from the windows, very fancy. Um, <laughs> uh, meanwhile, my kids go to the oldest school in the district, HTA, and we have walls that you can see through, not because there's some glorious window, but because the buildings are so old they've settled, and because the water in certain rooms is not potable because it's got lead in it. These are safety issues. They're also maintenance issues. And that was something that several of the committee members brought up, that when we talk to our community about what is safety in a school, safety in a school is a roof that we are not patching continuously, but we are finally taking the funds to repair. It is flooring or concrete that we go ahead and fix, lighting that we increase on campuses so that families who come to events that happen after dark are not tripping over who knows what. It's, it's all about understanding all of the different components that go into it. And the unfortunate part of funding in Arizona is that some of these basic needs like roofs, like floors, like concrete, like paint and things of that nature come from a bond and an override. And we have had 
opportunities to pass a bond before that have not have not qualified and have not met what the voters need and it's our job to educate and to and to make it clear that it, these are needs for our students these are not luxuries and I, I am urging the board to consider all of those factors when you look at that proposal. Thank you. Okay, moving on to the consent agenda. I motion to approve consent agenda items 5.1 through 5.21. Second. Ooh, that. Hey. Tiffany second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries five to zero. And I believe Mr. Lotzenheiser has some comments or introductions to make. Yes, President Anderson, members of the board, with the approval of the consent agenda, you just approved uh, for next year uh, two new administrative and administrative leaders at Williams Field High School. And we have both of them in the audience tonight. And so first I would like Mrs. Shana Lasarenza to stand up. If we can give Shana a big round of applause. <clears throat> For the past two years, Shana has been the Dean of Students at Williams Field High School, and now she will be the Assistant Principal of Activities moving into that role. We are very happy with the work that Shana has done there, and we know her ability and her aptitude will make her successful in the role of Assistant Principal. Second that you uh, approved was the approval of Mr. John Dolan as the Principal of Williams Field for next year. If you could stand, Mr. Dolan. <laughs> To those of you who have been in Higley for a while, Mr. Dolan is no stranger. He is currently the principal, and he was the founding principal of the Higley Virtual Academy. Prior to that, uh, Mr. Dolan was the principal at Sassaman Middle School, but even before that, he was an assistant principal of academics at Williams Field. And so this is a full circled moment for Mr. Dolan. But throughout the process, his knowledge of HUSD, his experience as a leader, but really his passion to return to Williams Field stood out, and we are so excited for Mr. Dolan uh, to take the reins of Williams Field and lead Black Hawk Nation uh, in the future. So thank you, Mr. Dolan, and congratulations. Thank you, and congratulations, both of you. I've heard um, really, there's a lot of excitement echoing throughout the district. Welcome and thank you. Um, Mrs. Johnson um, is going to give a, a benefits presentation for item, nope, that's, that's not right. Next will be community education from Dr. Lindsay and giving us an update, thank you. Good evening, President Anderson and members of the board. Tonight we have Ms. Kim Ohanian, our Assistant Director of Community Education, and she's gonna provide for you an update on all the amazing things that are happening within community ed. board and cabinet. Thank you for your continuous support and leadership to our district. I am Kimberly Ohanian, Community Education Assistant Director, and this presentation is to update you and the community on the HUSD Community Education Program offerings, including Kids Club, Enrichments, and our Higley Youth Sports League. Our students are the heart of our district, and community education is a true example of how we build connections within our community to provide opportunities for our students to flourish outside the classroom. As you know, connections is one of our core values, and students grow with us through education and to our own employees. As anchor number two states from our district strategic plan, highly effective personnel, the goal is to establish a climate and culture that sustains excellence and retains high quality employees. We have our new hires train at a site for three to five days based off of their position because we need them to be ready and equipped to care for our students. Our success is due to our staff in all areas of community education. I'm going to provide a brief, a brief overview of each of the component of community education and an update of our activities of this year. Kids Club is a before and after school child care program offered at each elementary school in both early childhood development centers. We are open Monday through Friday from 6.30 a.m. to 6 p.m. with a break for the regular school day. 
We are licensed by the Arizona Department of Health Services. In accordance to our license, each employee is required to obtain 18 hours of training a year, which we exceed here at Higley. Each of our locations follows a ratio of one employee to 20 students and a ratio of one to 12 for our pre-K students. When school is not in session, we also provide kids club camps for our families, which includes fall, winter, and spring break and throughout our summer. During these camps, we utilize 15 to 20 rooms at our hosting elementary schools. Each camp has a different theme and each room has a purpose aligned with the theme. These students do not repeat activities during the camp. Our incredible staff puts a lot of work into designing these hand-on engaging activities related to the themes of the camp. So for example, our last summer camp was hosted at Chaparral Elementary and the theme was Summer at the Movies. We rolled out the red carpet and we transformed our parent drop-off pickup room into a box office. Students played Minute to Win It games, they reenacted Scooby-Doo, they also reenacted scenes from their favorite movies such as I'm Still Standing from Sing, and much, much more. Our fall camp was hosted at Cortina, and the theme for this was Fun at the Farm. At this camp, students took a field trip to Mother Nature's Farm in Mesa, Rooster's Cogburns, and we even had some on-site animal visitors. Students participated in various science experience, experiments, made paper bag owls, and had some more fun engaging activities. Our campers celebrated winter around the world at our camp at Bridges Elementary. Students made passports and traveled on our own Higley Airlines to different countries around the world. We made cookies from various countries and we learned some important facts about those countries with some more of our hands-on activities. We also celebrated the holiday season through field trips at the Majestic Theater to see Elf and the Grinch. Finally, just a couple of weeks ago, over at HTA, we hosted our spring break camp. The theme for this year was Career Quest, where students learned about various jobs and career. So for example, our fourth and fifth graders went to Peter Piper Pizza and we got a behind the scenes tour on how to make their own pizza and what it really is like to run a business. On site, students practice sewing skills and design their own patent stitch. We owe a big thank you to our Gilbert Fire Department for showing the campers and sharing about their jobs and how the fire truck works. We got to learn some more important work of our own HUSD maintenance team and to see what they do to keep our schools operational, safe, and looking amazing. Finally, our students learned some more important careers at the airport through our field trip to the Mesa Gateway Airport. The pre-K even prepared for this trip with a little bit of their security training. Each grade attended this field trip for the behind the scenes tour of what happens to our luggage, visiting in a hangar, and those important safety protocols that actually happen on the tarmac. In addition to Kids Club, community education also offers after school enrichment clubs and courses for elementary and secondary students. These site-specific opportunities are led by district employees, mostly our teachers, who want to extend those educational opportunities outside the regular school day. Throughout the year, our fabulous HUSD staff provides enrichment courses and camps. Showcased here are Mrs. Leatherby's Mandarin Thrive class over the summer, exploring the Wall of China through 3D virtual quest, and her Mandarin Summer Fun students. Mrs. Pelea over at Power Ranch provides a creative club. She also leads a slime club for the students after school as well. Also highlighted on this slide is Ms. Schmidt from Coronado Elementary and her Wushu club performing at the HUSD Chinese New Year. Our Higley Youth Sports League is a recreational sports league that offers basketball, soccer, volleyball, flag football, baseball, and cheer. Our focus of HYSL includes player development, skill building, teamwork, and fun. Power Ranch Elementary is our current site that hosts HYSL on Saturdays. We also have Monday evening basketball. Our cheer season for K through six practices from October to March with a showcase to wrap up the season. HYSL coaches include district staff and many amazing parent volunteers to whom we are incredibly grateful. So we're always looking for coaches. So let me put a little plug in there to our community. We do need you. 
So reach out if you are interested in coaching sports for next year for HYSL. As I mentioned, HYSL also also offers an inclusive cheer program at each of our elementary schools from K through six. We had our largest turnout this season with 416 cheerleaders. Our showcase was hosted at the end of the year at Higley High School on February 28th. In addition to our cheerleaders and their families, our awesome coaches, we wanted to recognize the Higley High Varsity Cheer Team, the JV Palm, and our Higley Instrumental Association for participating in this event. Speaking of a good turnout, as you can see, our registration in community ed education program has increased over the last three years. The mission of HUSD Community Education is to provide quality, affordable, academic, recreational, and enrichment programs to all. And we challenge to inspire all me members of our growing and diverse community. We continue to work hard and to achieve that mission. We also had some fun organizing our own little district employee intramural league, which supports a healthy Higley initiative. So far, we have hosted softball, volleyball, and we're getting ready to kick off our HUSD Olympics this quarter. We've got ideas to bring some employee yoga and hiking soon, so stay tuned to learn more as we continue to expand those opportunities for our employees. Community education believes investing back into our schools. We have, ac we have actively pursued grants to help fund some major projects. Over the last year, $600,000 of grant money was utilized to upgrade playgrounds at various elementary schools. Shown here are the upgrades of the rubberized chips on Coronado's playground, the obstacle course that we helped fund at Chaparral, repairs to a climbing structure at Bridges Elementary, and swings, interactive panels, rubberized mulch to the kinder and the first through six play areas at Cortina. As we speak, the HTA Kinderground Playground is getting a much needed makeover as well. So finally, I wanna highlight our staff. Since 2021, we have also grown from 74 employees to 160. Many of these employees include HUSD student workers from Higley High and Williamsfield. We provide a learning experience for these students as they apply, interview, and onboard within community education. For many, this is their first job. So we wanna help them learn, grow, and be their very best for our HUSD students and families that we serve. I invited two of them to briefly highlight their experiences. So at this time, I'd like to introduce you to our Kids Club and HYSL staff, Mr. Jared and Mr. Rigdon. Good evening, my name is Jared Gunnell and I've been working here since October 2021. I started out just doing kids club and at the beginning of this school year, I started coaching for HYSL sports leagues. Um, I love kids club, but coaching really is the most rewarding part of the, what I do. Seeing these kids overcome little stuff like shooting a basketball from a certain spot or seeing them progress through the season, learning different ways to improve themselves and build up their teammates while being a good sport the whole way. Our program has brought students together who otherwise wouldn't have gotten the opportunity to meet each other, become friends. And uh, one of the most touching things I've seen being a part of community ed was a student who really struggled um, with his confidence in shooting the ball. Um, one of our most recent games, he, it was the first possession of the game, he just pulled up from the three-point line, drained it over like the biggest defender. It was, it was awesome. Um, it was really great to see how how his demeanor changed and, and how his teammates like rallied behind him and, and uh, it's really inspiring to see. Uh, this job has opened my eyes to education in general and has inspired me to further myself and pursue teaching. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak about my experience this evening and being a part of Community Ed. Hi, my name is Rigdon Owens. I'm 18 and I'm a senior at Higley. Uh, on June 17th of this year, it will be my official second year working for Kids Club. Uh, in these two years, I have hands down transitioned into a way better person. Uh, I walked into this district terrified, uh, not even able to hold myself up, uh, and I just not even knowing how to talk to an adult. 
Uh, this job has forced me to embrace the things I never wanted to do, like public speaking, uh, major leadership roles, and relationship building. With Kids Club being my only ever job I've ever had, I've had so much work experience here. Over our summer at the movies uh, camp, my job was to be an usher. I greeted families, uh, helped kids get to where they needed to be. With the fun themes of camp, we've also had themed job titles to match it. During fall camp, we had fun at the farm. I was a farm hand and held set up in the morning, field trip organizing, and just anything that was needed. This job has taught me many things going into real life. Besides those very real resume building things, I have also learned valuable lessons, whether that is how to hold an adult conversation, CPR, teamwork, and lastly, to understand how important jobs with kids truly are. This job has truly shown me that we workers make a difference in these kids' lives. Sometimes we are only their, their, we're their only examples, and that is truly terrifying. But while that is terrifying, it's also amazing to know that I have a purpose and create an impact. Lastly, I want to say thanks to Kim and Bell for creating a program that no, not only allows these kids to have fun and learn, but that allow for workers to flourish and learn. Thank you. And we also have a little guest speaker from Chaparral. Come on up. Miss Keelan would like to share some words as well. Hi, my name is Keelan Bohannon, and I'm in second grade at Chaparral Elementary. I've been in Kids Club since kindergarten. It is a fun way to make new friends, learn new things, and go on fun field trips during camp. All the teachers are so nice. All the kids are learning while having fun. I've even learned how to sew and crochet. I bought a few examples of some projects I have did during camp and school. First, this is my, I learned how to sew and crochet a button and uh, do a cross stitch with that. And I also brought one that I did from school, which was um, a rainbow coming out of a pot for St. Patrick's Day that I finished at home because I didn't have enough time at Kids Club. <laughs> And my teachers are Miss Martha and Miss Debbie, who taught me how to sew, Miss Nevea, Mr. Jared, Miss Lisa, Miss Sylvie, Miss Maddie, Miss Cheyenne, who just had her baby. They all make Kids Club great. I have known Miss Bell since kindergarten, and she makes everything about Kids Club amazing and fun. Kids Club helps me have fun till my mom gets off of work. Thank you so much for letting me share what I love about Kids Club. So as we look forward to summer in the 2024 and 2025 school year, we wanted to remind our community that summer camp registration is open. Our theme for this summer is cruising through the decades, and that includes a celebration of American pop culture. We want to share that Kids Club rates and fees will remain the same for the 2024-2025 school year. And that being said, as a part of our ongoing commitment to providing high quality programming, we will be researching some rates at our neighboring districts and may propose a rate increase to the board for 2025-2026 school year. So I'd like to close by thanking our community for your continued support and a role that community education plays in our district. And I am happy to answer any questions if you have some. Thank you. Phenomenal work. Thank, Thank you. you for sharing all that with us. Um, Jared and Rigdon, have the name's correct? Mm -hmm. Well done and, and welcome to <laughs> working through your fears and working with kids. You grew up a lot. <laughs> I do want to say you are appreciated more than you could probably ever know because just as you have the butterflies in your stomach each day probably, at least at the beginning, so do the parents. Um, my kiddos went before school or after school and in the summer. Um, it's a life-changing experience and you guys and all that you work with really do help these children to feel comfortable being away during the summer and missing their parents and helping the parents to just keep on and, and know that they're in great hands. So thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you.
Okay. Um, moving on to information item 6.2. Mrs. Johnson, you have information about benefits tonight? President Anderson, members of the board, um, I'd like to invite um, both my benefits manager, Ms. Isabel, and um, Ms. Jennifer Sherman up to the podium. They're going to help me with this presentation tonight. And I can't top that. I just, there's no way. Uh, wow, what work they're, what great work they're doing with our kids. This is awesome. And our new employees, right? Up and coming. So tonight we're going to talk about a benefit update. And, and this is the schedule of benefits for our employees that they will have choices, three different choices. And you can see the costs are there as well and the monthly cost and, uh, is across the board. So this year we experienced an average of 6% increase to the employee benefits. The district, HUSD, will be covering that cost uh, for the employee. The only group, if uh, an employee chooses to stay on the Choice 500, they will see an increase of approximately $5.93 per month for their own health care. So a very minimal cost to our employees this year. And there are no increases to the dependent or the, uh, the dependent coverage for this coming year. Next, I'm clicking. I got it, got it. So we have next is the uh, on salary, uh, the voluntary benefits that people can select, our employees can select. You will see that there are some increases to both the Delta Dental and the total dental administrators at a rate of three and 4% respectively. The one new thing that we were able to negotiate this year, if you look under the MetLife, um, this is our uh, short-term disability policy. In the past, an employee had to exhaust all of their general leave before they could tap into this benefit, even if they had purchased it and everything and paid the premiums. Now that will no longer happen. They are eligible at the time of when the short-term disability kicks in. So they will be able to use their general leave to offset um, uh, they're missing work, and then also they would get their short-term disability payment as well. So that was thanks to Kairos this year. We negotiated that with them, and they went to MetLife for us and said, hey, we want this, and this is a great change for our employees who choose short-term disability. Next, I am going to let Jennifer talk about this new addition of the Nurse Navigator Program. Okay. Uh, Kairos had instituted a program called Nurse Navigator Program. Um, I think it's going on four years ago now and have had um, incredible experience, great opportunity for savings, but more importantly, also impre improved outcomes for members. Um, some of the areas in which the nurses get involved with the membership include on the page that you see in front of you, helping to find in-network providers. We know um, as the industry faces financial struggles, those provider networks are shrinking. So our nurses are available to help people find the right doctor at the right time. Um, help with prior authorizations. We know sometimes people struggle to get the paperwork and the steps pushed through the system for those prior auths, so the nurses help push that along. Um, Post-discharge outreach from a hospitalization, the nurses oftentimes may reach out to the members to make sure they understand their um, treatment plan and have access to their um, pharmaceuticals that they need and um, all other things to help them get better. Care coordination is another way that they get involved, just general, how can we help you manage your care. Mental health support, a year ago we actually realized um, and invested in a mental health focused nurse. So our team is made up of five nurses today. We're looking to hire another nurse. One of those nurses does have a mental health focus and she is specifically in place today to help members find access to counselors, which again we've seen post COVID has been a struggle for people to find. Um, they help with coordination of EAP, again, um, assistance with mental health support. 
they do claims review and monitoring. So oftentimes members will um, have, say, a hospitalization, and they receive a myriad of bills and statements, and they're you know, concerned about what do I pay, what do I not pay, what's my responsibility. We immediately get them in touch with the nurses, and oftentimes we find that sometimes there's double billing or something of the sort, and we work with the healthcare providers to fix those processes and refund the money to the members. Um, resolution of questions and concerns, again, there really isn't an option for the nurses to say no. They're there to provide a service and to support our membership. So very service oriented, they're there to help in many ways, even going as far as helping people find um, access to food banks if they can't afford groceries versus prescription drugs. We're going to try and eliminate all of those barriers to care. And finally, prescription support. Um, for anybody that's had a new prescription medication, you know sometimes it's challenging to understand why the costs are so high. How much do you have to pay before you can pick up your medication? Those nurses have helped many members apply for prescription assistance funds and the like, so they're available for that level of support. Additionally, um, within the Nurse Navigator program, one of the ways that they help with administration is they are doing claims data review. So say, for example, we'll see high-cost claimants, and we do meet with Higley on a regular basis and review those claims. Sometimes we'll see a claim that comes through, and it does seem egregious in the amount that it's being billed, and those nurses are diving in to find out why is that cost so high for a procedure when we can see benchmarked it shouldn't be that high of a cost. Identification of lower cost service options. So they are first in pulling data out of a claims system and being able to say, well, it looks like if you go to this place of care, you would experience maybe this type of payment option for a service versus going to that type of care. One of the biggest resources that we found is helping to move people out of the hospital system when possible for services like labs and x-rays and advanced scans. If we can send you to a freestanding facility, we know it'll help save money for the member and for the plan. Monitoring of high cost and RX and medical treatments, we talked about that already. Monitoring for claims inconsistencies, I kind of stole my own thunder there. And finally, workman, workman's comp is another area that we have found a lot of success. Oftentimes members, when they have a workman's comp claim, they may not even just talk to the HR people or follow the right processes, and they go to their doctor and give their insurance card. Well, we are able to look at those claims and realize that might be a worker's comp injury and reverse those claims out of the health plan budget and push it over to workers' comp where it should be placed. Um, new this year to Kairos, we're very excited and we think we're gonna have tremendous um, support for our membership, is a program called Carum Health. Carum is something referred to as a center of excellence. Carum actually works with providers nationwide to find the best type of provider for certain types of procedures. And you can see on that page, um, the procedures include cardiovascular care, major orthopedic procedures, and some cancer care. But if we do find somebody that qualifies for those types of procedures, we're able to connect them with CARIM, and CARIM is able to connect them to centers of excellence or the top quality providers in the area, and sometimes not even in the area, maybe in another state, to receive that care. If, they, if the members choose to work with a CARIM provider, we know that those costs are a bundled charge and they're much less to the Higley Health Plan. Um, they're managed costs, and the member actually has access to that care. If they're on a PPO plan, they pay zero for that care. If you think about average cost for a hip replacement, a knee replacement, or worse, cancer treatment, um, to be able to provide those, provide those services at zero cost is really a powerful thing for our membership. We're very excited to be able to provide that solution. Um, if a member was on a high deductible health plan, because of IRS regulations, they will have to meet their portion of the deductible, which in this case the IRS requires $1,600. But once they meet that, then zero cost for the remainder of that care. This is a voluntary program, as I mentioned before. It's available to anybody that is enrolled in the plan. That includes active participants as well as COBRA enrollees. take a moment to brag a little bit because last year Isabel our benefits manager put together an awesome program to go out and service every employee at the sites one-on-one -on -one. and her and her one other person Valerie are gonna head out and do it again 
And so that open enrollment for our district begins April 22nd and through May 10th, there, it will be a passive enrollment, but yet there will still be available to everyone one-on-one -on -one support if they need it, they can sign up. We have an e-guide and a guidebook that between those two women up there have put together and will work with our employees to make a selection over that time frame. I'm really excited about um, the service that we provide and hoping that our employees will make some great selections for their health care. And the next one is questions for myself or for our guests. President Schultz. Uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> President Anderson. Um, I just want to know if there's any uh, risks associated with being self-insured. Yes, ma'am. Anytime um, an employer is building a health plan, there's risk associated. So risk if you're fully insured or self-funded. Um, this is not a one um, easy conversation to make those decisions. Um, as we started talking with Higley and the team, we did go through a thorough analysis of financial claims and also provider network benefits, and we're able to determine in making that move that not only were we able to provide a comparable, if not better, solution and service options, but also were able to save the district approximately $1 million in the first year. Embedded in the self-insurance product, if you will, we have a, a solution called stop-loss protection. So that just means that any high-cost claimants that hit the plan, there is a threshold at which those claims go up to a certain level, and then the stop-loss or the reinsurance carrier picks up that additional risk. So we do feel confident, and we do have evidence after the first um, year and change with Higley that we have demonstrated that that stop loss has actually been effective and the plan has still been able to save money over that fully insured platform. I hope that answers. Thank you so much. Yeah. No other questions? All right, thank you. Very thorough and I appreciate the information that you shared tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next we have item 6.3. Um, well, several items that we'll hear from Mr. Walker. Good evening, President Anderson, members of the board. Um, 6.3 first read for EBC emergencies. Um, we're bringing forward a recommendation that mirrors language from ARS 15-341 that just includes language that emergency response plans uh, includes how to communicate and provide assistance to students with disabilities. Are there any questions or comments, any additions? Okay, thank you. Mr. Thank Walker, you. Would you like to take us into 6.4 on the JKD student suspension? I'd love to. <laughs> 6.4 and 6.5, um, they both have the same statutory requirement update um, that's um, revised the K-4 suspension um, stipulation uh, that was passed two years ago in legislation. It's been since updated. Um, it provides some language that the suspension for students in grades K through four um, cannot exceed uh, two consecutive days uh, or an aggregate total of 10 days throughout the school year. Um, prior to that, there was a prohibition on suspension in grades K through four, um, and then students under the age of seven, there was a complete prohibition without any circumstances other than a firearm. And so the firearm uh, expulsion requirement has just been added to this policy. Um, it's already existed elsewhere, but it's just been included in uh, both JKD and JKE. So you'll see the same language updated in both policies. JKD is student suspension and JKE is student expulsion. No comments or questions? Thank you. Uh, do you want to roll through 6.5 as well, or do we feel like we covered both? Without a doubt, I'd be happy to do that. So 6.6, .6, uh, JLH. JLH is policy missing students. Um, the title's a bit misleading. What that policy in regards to is the administrative uh, window for school requirements. Uh, it stems from HB 2060 that changed as a result of ARS 15-828. It increases the window of time from five days to 10 days to request um, records from students coming from a different school or school district. 
and that was born out of uh, the request through legislation to reduce the administrative burden and give more time to process the documentation. So again, statutory language, just mirroring what's in the statute. Thank you. All right. Item 6.7, review of the fiscal year 2023 classroom spending report with Mr. Moore, please. Good evening, President Anderson, uh, members of the board. Tonight, I'm bringing forth the uh, FY23 classroom spending report. Uh, this is a request from the board to review, and so I'm presenting that tonight. So if we go to the next slide, uh, very short presentation, but I'm actually going to take you to the link. But I wanted to provide a little background on, on how this report uh, came about and uh, why the Auditor General does it. So annually, the Auditor General takes our annual financial report and puts it um, and compiles it into a classroom spending report. And that's what we'll go through in a second. Um, this was re introduced um, in statute um, and started back in 2001. And so this practice has been going on for about 23 years. Um, and so uh, again, the Auditor General is completely independent of the district. They take our financials and then uh, provide an analysis. Um, and this link uh, that we're gonna go to right now is public link that any uh, community member, board member, or um, uh, staff can, can go to. And so uh, this is what our uh, Higley Unified uh, Classroom Spending Report looks like. Uh, again, this is based off our fiscal year 2023 annual financial report. So that was uh, the year encompassing July 1, 2022 through June 30, 2023. And so I have a few highlights. I'm not gonna go line by line in this report. Um, but a few highlights uh, on how we uh, fared across um, our peer groups as well as, as our district. So first and foremost, um, I think the big uh, thing that, that comes across, right, is the big piece of the pie is instruction. Um, we, uh, across the board, um, have a, the, one of the highest levels of uh, expenditures in instruction. And I do want to clarify, this is all expenditures. This isn't just m and or one sort of bucket. This is all expenditures um, compiled into this report. And so uh, when you take all our expenditures, 60.7% um, of those uh, fall into that instructional category. Um, that is 7.6% above our peer groups and about 10.8% above our lowest uh, member in our peer group. Uh, and you can see how uh, we've kind of fared on the bottom there across uh, prior year, we've actually increased over, la over fiscal year 2022 from 59% to 60.7. Moving down the page, keep going a little bit farther. The Auditor General right here, uh, the Auditor General also analyzes um, percentage point spending by area as well as per student spending by area. Um, each one of these areas kind of, uh, again, resembles all expenditures, but um, you can see from uh, year to year um, our expenditures in instruction have increased, as well as student support and instructional support. And just to remind the board what those categories kind of entail, uh, instructional support, instruction is pretty obvious, that's our teachers, our classroom supplies, um, everything that is involved in providing instruction to our, to our students. Instructional support is our librarians, teacher training, curriculum development, um, special education, media specialists, and instructional related technology. Um, and you can see that uh, was up over last year, um, or excuse me, to student, su that's student support. Um, student support is up over last year, I got this wrong. Student support is up 1.4%. That includes counselors, speech pathologists, nurses, social workers, and attendance services. Our instructional support is about level or flat. Um, our administration is down over last year, over FY22, excuse me. Plant operations are down, food service is slightly down, and transportation is relatively flat. Um, looking on the right graph, you'll see, again, comparison per student spending by area. Um, pretty much increases across the board. Um, a lot of that is derived from our, our budgetary um, numbers and, our, again, our total expenditures increasing from fiscal 22 to 23. The one area, again, I wanna point out, uh, food service is down. Uh, the, the main reason that is down is because COVID relief funding um, in 22, COVID uh, meals were free. 
the federal government issued a, a memorandum that had uh, meals be free. And so in 23, that expired. And so you'll see that uh, expenditures, not every student was now eligible for meals. So we spent a lot less money um, in that food service category. If we scroll down the page, please, we'll look at operational efficiency measures. Um, again, this graphic um, takes our operational categories, measures them against um, the state average, our peer average, and then you can see our district average. And so um, across the board, I think we fare very well um, amongst our peer averages. So administration, um, just for example, the state average uh, per student is $1,207. Um, our peer average, again, that's peer districts who have similar ADM or, or student uh, size is, is $1,116 per student, and whereas uh, Higley's under $1,000. And again, I've, I've, I think I've mentioned this to the board, but we operate very lean in our administration, and it's resembled in this independent report. You'll see student per administrative position. Uh, Higley is 81, um, 81 uh, per student, So, it, whereas our peer average is 65. And so it just tells you how many more students our administrators are, are basically handling on a case-by-case -case basis. And so that's where you get the district spending relative to peer group average on very low. Um, some of the other highlights, um, kind of again with food service, um, some of the reasons we track very low, uh, a lot of this kind of depicts on our, our demographics. Um, we are not a high free and reduced population. And so, um, Coincidentally, we, we don't have a lot of those high meal costs because we're not providing a lot of free meals. And so um, being, you know, some of this is demographic based and you can kind of um, grasp some of that information off of this page um, when you look against some of our peer districts who have very vastly different demographics. Um, they'll have a lot of high spending in food service and transportation where maybe those families don't have the means to provide or send their student with a, a meal from home or the transportation to drop their student off. They utilize the, the school bus uh, or the, the food service uh, meals that the district provides. And so that's where you see kind of transportation food service trending very low in our district. Some of that's demographic based. If we scroll down the page, keep going. Right here, so we'll look at, scroll back up just slightly. There we go. So this is average teacher salary. Um, this has been an emphasis by the Auditor General ever since the uh, 20 by 20 plan and to really track and um, highlight some of the efforts that districts are doing across um, teacher pay. Um, you'll see our teacher pay, our average teacher salary is 66,000. Um, and they actually break out the exact amount from classroom site fund. Again, that's averaged um, across all our teachers. So when, when you see our amounts on our um, salary schedules, um, you have to take and keep in mind when you average that across prorated teachers who, who work part-time and full-time teachers, a lot, a lot of times that number will be lower than what is listed on the, our salary schedule because it's averaged over a mean of, of all our teachers. So some of the highlights, um, I think we're $3,800 above the state average um, on an on a average teacher pay. Um, just three years ago, you'll see a graphing that said we were below the state average. So. Um, kudos to the, the governing board and the district for, for making uh, vast strides and getting to a competitive point um, in terms of teacher pay. Our average years of teacher experience is 10 years. Um, next year, we'll actually um, have a, a TI teacher experience index um, uh, boost on our, on our budget, very small, but we have now kind of creeped up into the area of uh, meeting um, kind of the average or just above the average teacher experience uh, amongst districts. And so that means we have a, a larger experienced teacher staff. Um, and so we're not, we're not the young Higley anymore. We are, we are, uh, we are growing up <laughs> to some extent. Um, and so it's represented here. You'll see our average years of teacher experience, 10 years. So um, they, do, they did a new comparison this year with um, first year teachers within their three years and then teachers four years or later. Um, you know, I could have told you how that would, that would have paired out. You know, younger teachers generally have less experience, um, whereas teachers you know, four years or, or greater have more experience, which is why their pay is, is, is slightly different in that sense. Um, if you move down the page, this is a graphic here that where I was um, 
alluding to where we were below the state average in 2020. And so if you look at the line um, that's, that's going across the page, that's the state average for teacher salary. The pink amount is the amount from other funds. So for the most part, that's M&O. Um, and the gray amount is the amount from classroom site fund monies um, that supports that teacher pay amount. So um, you can see as of 2021, uh, we exceeded that state um, average teacher salary. And now we are well above that, that mark um, and, and regarded as one of the, the higher paying t districts for teacher pay um, amongst not only our peers, but um, in K-12 education in Arizona. So again, um, I do wanna highlight though that gray amount within that, that bar graph, um, you can see a large majority is coming from that classroom site fund. And so that six cent sales tax um, does play an important role in, in again, um, not only supporting the level of teacher pay that we're at now, but also increasing it. And so um, a lot of factors go into that number and, and it's, it's the illustration, I couldn't create a better graph. So this is why we're, we're looking at the uh, Auditor General's website because I think it's illustrated well here. If we scroll down, um, I keep going down. The, the two years ago, um, they added, um, if you scroll up just a little bit so we can, just go up a little more, there we go. Okay, they added a student achievement section. Um, and again, I think it's no secret that Higley's a, an overall um, high achieving district. Um, and again, it's represented here, not only, um, so you can see our district represented in the gold and our peer groups represented in, in dark blue and then statewide represented in light blue. And so, um, you know, it's not just me telling you we're high achieving, the, the data and the Auditor General is, is um, showing the, the data that, that the, this district is continued, continually achieving above not only the state average, but our peer groups um, in several of the categories, such as math, English, ELA, and science. And so um, with that, I'll be happy to take any questions. But again, this report is on the Auditor General's website. It is a public report. Um, and anybody has access to go view it and do a deep dive into the data. President Anderson, Mr. Moore, I just want to go back to the portion where it shows the student per teacher and that we are averaging about 17, 18 students per teacher. Yes, yeah. I, I mean, the footnote there right, right below it, um, that is divided by the total number of certified teachers, um, and that includes specials, arts, music, physical ed. Um, so when you take in a lot of those classes, when you go to a high school PE class, you're gonna see very high. But when you look at some of our specials, they trend below um, 20 kids per student. So um, again, it's averages. It's hard to depict that as um, you know, general education. You also have special education in there, which are, are a lot lower than 17. Um, so just keep that in mind. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if we can scroll back up to where you were at the beginning talking about the percentage point change in spending area. Um, when you went over it, we were on the five-year comparison. So I just want to show that we can toggle that to the one-year comparison. Oh, I'm sorry. Little, that's okay. Yeah. Just look a little different. That's all. And then, again, open access so anybody can sit there and toggle between the years and, and look at it. But this... Um, this has changed over the years too. It's definitely more detailed and have more data, which is so nice to see. And then you can look at other districts, sneak into theirs, and um, it's just not limited to everybody. Are there any questions or comments? Okay, thank you, Mr. Moore. Um, next, we're going to move on to information item 6.8, the Citizens Committee recommendation. Oh, Mr. Moore's back on. Yes. Uh, good evening, President Anderson, members of the board. Tonight, I'm a do my best to uh, present a summary of the uh, Citizens Committee process. Um, I want to, well, I'll get into it in a second, but. Um, so again, I just want to remind the board about the Citizens Committee. Um, again, it was uh, an, an item brought forward from uh, myself to the board to um, kind of change the process and how we've called for elections um, in the past. And so um, there is several uh, community members as well as um, 
uh, individuals in our district um, that wanted a more uh, involved process. And so this was my um, recommendation to try to um, achieve that result. And so, again, we um, brought forth uh, this, this um, notion. Um, all meetings um, were open to the public. Information from each meeting and the minutes are all available on our website. Um, our thanks to our PR team. They've been uh, doing a great job of keeping that updated as the meetings have uh, transpired, as well as uh, any of the minutes being approved. So um, if I don't do a good job of summarizing this, you can go and do a deep dive into each one of those meetings. Just to highlight the, the timeline. So again, I brought forth this recommendation on November 15th. Uh, the governing board approved that recommendation. The district received about 80 applications for this. Um, and as a reminder, um, each governing board member got to nominate an individual as well as, well as the district administration um, pick 10 at large from those um, 80 applicants. So um, the series of five citizens committee meetings occurred between January and March. Um, there was five meetings. Um, I tried to stick within an hour, but there was a lot of questions. There was a lot of good questions. Um, there's a lot of information to cover. And so I think cumulative, we spent about 10, probably 10 to 11 hours. And I don't know what individual time each member spent, but um, between these five meetings. Tonight, I'm presenting um, the committee's recommendation. Um, again, doing my best to summarize that process. Um, I do want to highlight though tonight's recommendation is, is just to the approval of this on a later agenda item is just to give me direction to bring forth a formal resolution. So those who've been through the election process, Ms. Reese, understand that the, this is not a, a resolution to call for an election. This is a recommendation from the committee. I will still need to bring back a resolution um, drafted by an attorney um, that officially calls for the election. And so that will take place on the May 8th meeting pending um, the board's decision tonight. So I um, just want to highlight the Citizens Committee. Um, I know a few are in the audience and so maybe they can stand up. Um, I appreciate you know, all of their time that they spent. Um, okay, maybe we can give them a round of applause. So. Um, I, I appreciate all the time they spent in, in not only just willingly coming to, to learn about this, um, but, to, but being deeply involved in it, um, asking a, a lot of questions. Um, and again, I feel like the recommendation tonight um, is an expression of the committee as a whole. Um, I do want to note Jennifer Nunez missed the first meeting, and then at the second meeting she did um, indicate that she would not want to be involved in the meeting, and so the committee voted to just not fill that position. So ultimately, we went forward with 14 members, uh, not 15, so. All right, so let's get a highlight of the committee meeting process. So meeting number one, um, I presented uh, the same School Finance 101 uh, presentation that I've done to the governing board. Um, that, present, that presentation covered a high level, um, uh, information about school funding formula and how H HUC calculates its budget. Also at the meeting, uh, we discussed the MNO override history. This is a snippet of the, of the history. Um, it just represents the snapshot of the last three years, but the full timeline is actually on our website. Um, that timeline dates back to 2003 when Higley first passed uh, an MNO override. And at that time, that was a 10% override. But I do want to highlight, so this graph shows currently we are fully funded, again, through fiscal 25. I've mentioned that in my budget presentations. Um, in 26 and 27, uh, there's a phase down. While it's a seven-year authorization, there's only five years of fully funding. And so, again, if, um, again, pending the board's decision to move forward with an election um, and that it passes on a ballot, we would proceed into that 26 um, phase down period. That'd be phase one, and that'd be a reduction of 33% of that override. And then, again, pending any uh, pr uh, further elections um, in 27, that'd be a phase two, down, uh, phase two, and that would be 66% reduction. And then if we get to 28 with no uh, ballot initiative passed to continue this override, that would be completely phased down. And just for note, that was $13.1 million on our last budget, um, adopted budget. On meeting number two, um, we had applied economics uh, come in. 
and do a uh, updated demographic and enrollment analysis report. Um, again, the committee also recommended a high ground consulting conduct a registered voter survey. Uh, I'll cover that in uh, meeting number four when the survey results, um, when I actually have the survey results in here. But just to um, give some preference on the applied economics demographic report, uh, semi-annually the district does a deeper dive into our demographics um, by way of third-party demographic reports. So applied economics is one of the, the state's best demographers or demographers. Um, and this data in this report represents um, what they presented, a snippet from what they presented to the committee. And so looking at the first graph on the screen, this shows history back um, from 40 day head count back to 2000, 2001. Um, on, the, uh, on the blurb to the right, you can actually see that enrollment skyrocketed from fewer to 1,000 students uh, in 2000, 2001 to nearly 10,000 students in 2010 to 2011. Uh, that was the period in which Higley went through a hyper growth phase um, that represented a compounding annual growth of 30% um, even despite the Great Recession. And so during that phase, a lot of our schools, uh, our elementaries were built in that time and funded by SFB uh, because of that growth number. Now, uh, looking at the current year, you can see our growth has kind of leveled off. Um, and we'll jump to the next slide where I've, uh, looking at the detail by grade. And so looking at grades K2 represented in red, 3-5 represented in purple, and 6-8 represented in green, as well as 9-12 represented in blue. Um, as I've highlighted to the board in my budget presentations, we've seen um, at most recent, the last couple of years, a decline in elementary education, or education enrollment. And that is represented in the, the red graph, as well as the purple graph, where you can see over the last couple of years, ever since COVID, we've seen a, a steady, steady decline in those numbers. On the flip side, you can see cohorts in grades 6, 8, 9, 12, as I've mentioned, have seen an increase. Um, and with 9, 12 continuing continue, continue to see a steady increase ever since uh, 2016, 2017. Now, I don't expect you to read this um, verbatim, but I'm gonna highlight the bottom kind of cell that I have highlighted there in the, in the light blue. Um, this is a deeper dive into the numbers, uh, but I think it provides some context and some important um, information to the board. So uh, the first column, reading left to right, so the first column uh, represents our fiscal year. Pretty self-explanatory there. The second column is our total households within the district boundaries. So it's 31,133. And so you'll see that number continually increasing over the course of that uh, timeline. Um, as we've been, uh, as our 24 square miles that continues to be built out, right? We, still, we continue to see housing developments, um, but that land is starting to level off. Right? We're starting to see some of those, not as much vacant land within our district. And so we'll uh, anticipate seeing that level off. On the third column is the total number of school aged students within our boundaries. And so that is represented at 23,247. The fifth column represents the percentage of households that have school age population students, which is 74%. So that means three out of four houses have a school age population student in them on average, which is very high. That is, that is extremely high. Um, looking at our enrollment uh, column, Six. Uh, that is our 43 head count. Again, 12,920. You take the enrollment number divided by the total number of households, and that gives you column seven, the percentage of households that have Higley students. So again, that's the percentage of households that have Higley students. That's 41.5 percent. Column eight shows the net difference of Higley enrollment versus the total school age population at 10,327, which would be a capture rate of 55.6%. However, you have to back out <clears throat> column nine, which is the added district enrollment, which represents 1,839. And that determines our true capture rate, which we take column 10, the district enrollment of 11,081, divided by the total school age population to get, again, our true capture rate of 47.7%. So we in our 24 square miles, out of the total eligible uh, school-age population of students, we capture 47% choose Higley. 
Um, and again, that shows really our, our competition, right? We, we know that we have charters across the street. We have um, Gilbert Christian, right? We have a lot of competition within 24 square miles. And so that's, it's um, showcased in this, in this number right here. Moving to number, committee, uh, meeting number three. Um, at this meeting, we reviewed the current MO override uh, and the capital needs of the district. Um, the MRO override was briefly discussed at the committee, as I think the majority of the committee understood what it was already supporting. Um, and so there's limited discussion on the override, but I did provide the bullet points again as a reminder for the, the governing board. The majority of the time was spent on the capital needs and the proposed projects of the district. Um, these were presented to the committee, and the complete detail, can, again, can be found on our website. To summarize, the 12.8 million for safety, security, and technology improvements represents the continued investment into security cameras, classroom technology, including display panels, student devices, and network infrastructure to support these devices. The 25 million in essential maintenance projects represents the ongoing maintenance needs of the district for the next five years. The committee reviewed the district's five-year capital plan which indicated replacement costs for life cycle items across the district, including roofing, flooring, weatherization, HVAC, and playgrounds. On the next slide, I'll cover the, oh, let me go back. On the next slide, I'll, oh, there's the next slide. But I'll cover the 40.3 million campus improvements, but on the, the 5 million allocated for buses, the current a, a average age of our fleet is 12.4 years. Um, we have 27 buses over 15 years and two over 20 years. And so um, that number indicates a level that uh, about three buses, three to four buses per year uh, to help us uh, keep up with the aging fleet uh, of our transportation. So like I said, the 40.3 million in campus improvements was spread across the two high school district, or two high schools. Uh, first, looking at Higley High School, the campus uh, front lobby um, does not have the necessary features to, to total secure the lobby, which include um, restrooms. There's no public restroom. So if a, a guest is visiting, they have to be let into the campus, uh, whereas all our elementaries and our middle schools have restrooms uh, where guests do not need to enter our campus to, be, to use a restroom. Number two and number three, um, well, I would say that the rest of this list, um, the main theme for the next six items relates to the school outgrowing its original design. Um, Higley High was built in 2001, which makes the school 23 years old, uh, with drastically different enrollment numbers from when the school was originally built. And so again, this these next six items reflect a lot of the growing pains that has occurred um, during the course of that time. So number two and number three would be relocating the tennis courts to make room for additional parking to support not only the student population, um, but also the HCPA, as well as various events that, the, that Higley High hosts. Number four is addressing the field house, which was built in 2010 when the enrollment was half of what it is now. The plan would be to expand the field house, not replace it. Um, at that time, that, uh, the district Higley High was in a 3A um, uh, category in terms of AIA sports, which is, we are now 6A, uh, again, doubling in size in terms of our participation in athletic sports, um, creating some safety concerns with uh, the field house and the capacity in which it can house students safely um, as well as staff. Number five is addressing the practice fields. Um, these, these high school campuses are used almost 24-7. Um, those practice fields are not lit. Um, so by lighting them, it would allow for greater use for not only our um, uh, sports teams, uh, but also for rentals. Um, number six, again, addressing capacity issues uh, would be expanding the bleachers to allow more occupants for events. Um, our bleachers, again, do not, cannot even hold the entire capacity of our student body. Um, that's Mr. Fields, uh, yeah, he is, but um, he has to do multiple sessions when doing um, any sort of um, district-wide, or school-wide um, student body presentations, et cetera, as well as our games, if you've ever been to a football game or any sort of event, um, those fill up rather quickly. Number seven is a carryover from the previous bond proposal, but again addresses the lack of capacity within the gym facility. 
and it looks to expand that uh, gym. Again, it was built in 2001 to allow additional op options for the campus. So again, allowing for potential to host a, stu a whole entire student body um, events, um, allowing for the potential to host AIA events. Um, it, we have outgrown that facility. On the flip side, looking at Williamsfield, you'll see a lot of the same um, themes. Um, again, our high schools have outgrown um, the current um, footprint of where they, when they were originally built. Um, the first, the number one item is moving the transportation facility. Um, <clears throat> you can see on the bottom of the screen, transportation facilities takes up a majority of the, the Williamsfield High School campus, um, approximately eight acres. The district does have a vacant piece of land uh, behind Target, in which um, right currently we do not have the intention of building a new school. Um, it is perfectly um, zoned, essentially, for industrial. Um, and so utilizing that vacant piece of land by moving the, the transportation facility will open um, Williamsfield's campus up for additional options, um, which include number two, uh, much like we did at Higley High School, Williamsfield is at capacity in their need for a classroom addition. Um, so that would be number two. Number three, again, Williamsville has the same issues Higley High in regards to the front lobby. Um, there's no public restroom in that front lobby. So when, again, guests or parents or anybody visiting that campus um, needs to use the restroom, they need to be let into the campus, which, prevent, which opens up a safety concern. Number four includes moving the tennis courts and sand volleyball courts to make space for number five, which is an additional uh, practice field. If you look at uh, Williamsfield versus Higley, um, Higley has some additional options for practice field space. Um, Williamsfield does not. That main field gets used 24-7. Um, that is lit. And so by moving those two uh, tennis courts and sand volleyball courts to potentially where the transportation facility was, um, it does open that campus up to provide additional practice space for the sports that take place um, and have to share space currently between football, band, soccer, um, et cetera. So uh, it gives that campus a little more flexibility and um, allows them to breathe a little. Number six, again, addressing capacity issues is, again, the bleacher expansion. Um, again, these were original bleachers that were built when the school was adopted, and so um, looking at our enrollment numbers, we've greatly um, outgrown that original capacity. And again, number seven, much like Higley, focus on renovating the gym to provide a space um, to um, allow additional capacity uh, for various events, not only their, their sports teams now, um, but also hosting events um, and then utilizing um, that gym space in a, a more effective manner, again, to host maybe student body, um, uh, pep rallies, et cetera. So that summarizes meeting number three. Meeting number four, the committee toured Higley Traditional Academy. Uh, I want to thank, I know she's not here, but Ms. Bacon, uh, she provided that tour um, along with uh, Ms. Day um, and gave us a quick tour of Higley Traditional Academy. As one of our oldest schools in the district, we have some buildings on that facility from the 1980s. Um, in addition, High Ground Consulting reviewed the registered voter survey results, which I'll cover in a second. And then the district presented the capital funding calculation showing the deficit in capital funding to maintain the current capital needs. This was at request of the committee. And so uh, you'll see the, the capital funding deficit calculation below. What this shows is our major maintenance totals um, across from fiscal year 25, which would be next year to 29. Um, this is based on life cycle replacement timelines. So for example, um, within that eight million, there'd be several weatherization and flooring projects because at year 15, that is the general timeline in which you, you replace flooring. HVAC units are general um, chillers, are big um, chillers and, and cooling towers. Those are on a 20 year cycle. So those would be, we, we track that as a district and those would be, we have a, we have a realist, or we have a, I should say realist, we have an optimistic time in which we should replace those. And then oftentimes um, we are kicking that can down the, sh down the street because of budget constraints, which is represented in the line number two. Uh, approximately 16% of our capital budget is for maintenance needs. And later on the agenda, you'll see our capital budget 
there, there's not a lot of wiggle room um, in terms of adding additional budget capacity to that. Um, and so if you take that, our annual maintenance capital budget that is provided by the state of 850,000 and we maintain that 16%, um, you'll see the deficit that we continue to track um, year over year uh, by not replacing those items on the time in which uh, they should be replaced based on their useful life. Uh, so then we get instances where, um, you know, for example, Higley High went well beyond its weatherization exterior painting and so, you know, that, that campus looked horrible. And so we have flooring that has duct tape on it. We have several instances where items are being stretched past the use for life. And so um, in a perfect world, we would be able to replace those at the time in which those expired. Um, but realistically, we have been unable to keep up with those needs. And um, right now, we are realizing all those needs at once because of that hyper growth in 2006 and 2007. So. All right, jumping into the survey results. Again, I mentioned in meeting two that the committee chose to move forward with a, a survey of our registered voters. Um, High Ground conducted the survey among, amongst 400 uh, likely voters from February 5th through February 12th. The margin of error, uh, according to High Ground, uh, for a survey like this is plus or minus 5%. Um, and so what, uh, in his experience, you can take these results uh, to the November election and be within plus or, f plus or minus 5%. And so um, I've snipped a few of the survey questions that I felt reflected the, the results. But again, on our website, you can find the complete uh, results of the survey. Um, to start off, the survey asked some general questions about K-12 education in our local community. And you can see it represented here. Um, that in general, the question was in general, would you say that your local community is heading in the right direction or wrong direction? Um, generally, 53.8% um, say that our local community is heading in the right direction. 33% said totally wrong, and then we had 13% that did not know or refused to answer. You can see the demographics on the, the bottom half of the slide, um, age demographics also with kids or without kids. The survey also asked um, some questions regarding K-12 education on a national level. Um, and so the question was, in general, would you say that K-12 education in your community is heading in the right direction or wrong direction? And so you can see how the trend um, on the national level, that is vastly different than our local um, question. So 37% said um, totally right, whereas 45.8% said totally wrong. And so um, the theme uh, and what I garnered out of this was on the national the national narrative is, is a lot different than what's happening in our local community um, amongst our registered voters. Again, this is our registered voters. Again, same demographics on the bottom. Again, kids, no kids. And so getting into um, some of the, the tests against our MNO override and a potential bond, um, the high ground, um, utilized, one thing I want to point out, they utilized the actual language that will have to be in the ballot. And so I think that's important to note because um, this language is, is tough to read. Um, it, it is not read well if you're not um, familiar with school finance or school overrides. Um, but they did test that exact language that the district would have to use in a ballot. And so uh, the question asked, shall the governing board of Higley Unified School District adopt a general maintenance and operations budget? That means override. Uh, which includes an amount that exceeds the revenue control limits specif specified by statute by 15% for fiscal year 25, 26, and for six subsequent uh, additional years. Um, again, knowing just what you know now, would you vote yes or no on this budget continuation? And so, again, this was considered the pre-test. I'll explain the post-test in a second. But um, with that question being asked, you can see um, across our registered voters and who was surveyed, 47.8% said yes, 41.2% said no. Um, after this series of questions, the survey participants were provided a few additional statements uh, regarding possible reasons someone might support the override, such as Higley Unified is an A-rated district and excels academically, and the budget continuation is not a tax rate increase. In addition, the survey participants Participants were also provided statements regarding possible reasons someone might not support the override, such as 
schools in our uh, country are out of control and deserve an, don't deserve another penny of our taxpayer dollars. And even discussing that Higley has had its fair share of problems and shouldn't renew this funding until the district gets its act together. So looking at the post-test, so again, after the survey members were provided that information um, and asked the same question again, would you support the override? Um, I'm not gonna read it verbatim, but you can see after that information, the, the uh, results fared a lot better in, in the favor of the district. So 61.1% said yes, 30.9% said no. And so um, looking at the net changes of that, you can see across all demographics with providing some of that additional context into what this is for, um, a little bit about Higley, um, it, to, the one, to the individuals surveyed, um, it had them um, change their vote and change their mind into which way they were voting. Um, the one interesting to me is the biggest change, it was the 65 plus, over 20%. So again, we did the same thing on the bond. And again, the bond question was, shall Higley Unified District be authorized to issue and sell general obligation bonds of the school district in the form of class B general obligation bonds in the principal amount not to exceed 75 million? At the time, the committee had not finalized the recommendation, so that was the number that was used. Um, but for the purpose of raising monies for school safety, renovation and repairs, and modernization, other general capital expenses. So again, knowing just what you know now, would you vote yes or no on the bond? Looking at those results, um, surprisingly, it fared um, above 50%. 58.3% said yes, whereas 32.7% said no. And we had about 9% that said don't know or refuse. And again, um, the uh, uh, post-test, well, here, I'll show again. Um, this was asked pre-test. Um, in addition, we also asked the survey individuals about uh, several of the items that might be in the bond um, and asked um, regarding how would you vote on the general obligation bond and pulled various categories such as these. Again, we weren't finalized with the Citizens Committee recommendation yet, so these categories um, may not all be reflected in the final proposal, but um, I think it provides some interesting context for the board. Um, again, the scale uh, was one, from one to five, uh, one being not important at all, two being not very important, three being neutral, four being somewhat important, five being very important. And so um, school safety and security improvements, uh, as well as HVAC and air conditioning and security cameras, all fared um, extremely high in this, um, in this poll. Um, you'll see as we make our way down the list, um, some of the things that did not fare well or were just above mean uh, flooring, transportation and maintenance facility, as well as Williamsville modernization and energy efficient lighting. So interesting information um, from our surveyed voters. Um, again, they were provided a, a post-test. Um, they were also, again, provided statements uh, that you might, might hear as reasons to support the bond and statements that you might hear as reasons to oppose uh, the bond, the bond proposal. And so you can see this fared uh, drastically different um, than the override in terms of pre and post. Um, this actually, the post tested, um, this fared worse on the post test once they knew, once they were asked both of those um, statements, um, supporting the bond and opposing the bond. Um, looking at the, the comparison, the net changes um, across the board pretty much um, well, I wouldn't say across the board. So interesting, under 29, it, it actually increased. Um, 30 to 39, it decreased. And then 40, 49, it increased. But then the rest either remained flat or decreased in terms of that post. Once they received that information, again, um, whether you, um, those statements regarding support or oppose the bond. So with that, the final question, um, again, was asked if both budget and continuation bond issues were put on the ballot, which of these opinions come close to your, closest to your own? And so they asked, um, I would likely vote yes on both. Um, that was 44.3%. I would likely vote only for the budget continuation. I would likely vote only for the bond. And I would likely vote, on, uh, vote no on both and don't know, refuse. And so the continuation, if you add likely vote yes, on both as well as the 
vote only for the budget continuation, you can see has 63.63% support. The bond is the total of the likely vote both on yes, as well as the 7%, and that is at 51.3%. Um, yeah. All right, the last meeting um, we met at Higley High School in the new um, building edition. Um, I know several members got to tour that facility, and I think Higley Traditional was fresh on their memory, um, and so I know um, that was a drastic change in facility um, uh, space. But the committee received a presentation from Stiefel reviewing the potential tax implications of the proposed m and override and continuation, as well as the bond proposal. In addition, the committee took a roll call vote at the end of the meeting um, and voted to bring a proposal that I'm presenting tonight to be brought forth to the board. Um, a couple of the slides that I want to highlight from the Stiefel presentation include um, this, this uh, snippet of the graphic below. Um, our statutory bonding capacity continues to increase. Um, that part of the main reason is our net full cash, full cash um, assessed valuation, so our property values um, continue to increase. And I think it's no, it's no secret if you get your, your tax bill, you'll see your, your tax, taxable amount on your residential home. Um, is increasing, um, as well as the market rate is increasing. Um, but it's important to note that um, uh, assessed valuation, um, net full cash is used for bonding capacity, uh, and then um, there's a limited assessed valuation which is used for your tax rate. But the, the main point on this, um, we have approximately, um, going into next year, an estimated at $328 million in bonding capacity. You'll see the recommendation doesn't even come close to that. Um, we have approximately, as of 9-1-24, 61 million in outstanding uh, Class B bond debt. So that is bond debt that has been issued that we're still paying down. Um, I, I'm not gonna have you guys read through this slide, but this is a example of a debt schedule that would be potentially approved or put into a, a, a voter pamphlet. Um, the main things I wanna highlight um, are on this next slide, which include um, some of the estimated tax impact for the current proposed $83.1 million. Um, on a residential property, um, you can see the reflection of the first, um, the first graph or chart. $287,448 is, is our Gilbert um, right now um, average uh, assessed value residential home. So on the, on the average, um, residential homeowner for, for Gilbert. For this bond proposal, it would be an estimated average monthly cost of $7.61, an estimated average annual cost of $91.32. Um, for a estimated um, uh, total cost over the course of the 20-year bond of $2,110.48. That's on the notes to the right. Um, I'm not going to go over commercial or residential, but they're, they're assessed on a different uh, tax basis, and you can see their tax impact being higher than a residential family. I'm sorry, Ms. Reese. Okay. So the recommendation um, from, the, from the committee, again, I, I mentioned earlier, overwhelmingly, I think the continuation that I'm going to override um, was, was holistically uh, a, a no-brainer for the committee. Uh, I think everybody was in support of the m and override. And so um, when I presented this uh, proposal uh, to vote on for the board, um, this was indicated as item number one um, because, again, th this was um, unanimous in terms of the committee's opinion to, con to continue um, the m and override. Um, where we had a discussion and where the votes came in um, different were on the bond recommendation. And so um, we brought forth three recommendations represented on the top graph was the full uh, bond package that I presented tonight, 2A, that totals 83.1 million. Uh, 2B was also presented. Um, this was a, a conversation that we had to remove um, some of those short um, those items that have a short useful life, such as technology, um, transportation buses. So um, those were removed, um, and that represents just essential maintenance, 
and campus improvements, or excuse me, um, campus improvements and safety and security. I said that wrong. They removed the central maintenance and left in safety, security, and campus improvements. Option 2C uh, was no bond and just focus on the MNO override um, for this upcoming election. And so on the right there, you can see how the votes um, panned out. So seven votes came in for option 2A, uh, zero votes for 2B, three votes for 2C, um, one email to vote for 2A. I did not get to share that with the committee in time, um, but I did want to note that. I did want to note that. And three did not vote um, or were not present at the time we took the vote. And so um, with that, I do want to, I do have a couple of uh, committee members that um, I invited um, who, who asked to speak um, and wanted to provide um, their experience on the committee. So I don't know who wants to go first, Vanessa or Eric, but if you want to. Hi, good evening. My name is Eric Brown. I, um, I have three students in the district, uh, one in elementary, one in middle school, and one in high school. Uh, one's in special ed, one is in the gifted program, and one attends EBIT too. So we have had all of the benefits of the public education in our family. Um, in my day job, I'm a, a assistant public works director for the town of Gilbert, and I have a deep understanding of the disconnect between local government and the public. And so I wanted to use my experience for the benefit of our students um, by serving on this committee. Um, as I'm responsible for utility services in Gilbert, I have to find ways to pay for the increased costs to deliver those services um, to our community. And I know that our professional staff can get tunnel vision on the needs to provide the service and they can forget that we have to inform our governing bodies of those needs and the public that ultimately has to pay for those. So my job is to connect all those dots. And so I wanted to do that here because I suspected that Higley might have that same problem based on the results of the last override and bond elections. So I knew going into this process that there were funding needs in the district, but my eyes were open to how many. Um, the team did a great job, Tyler, Gustavo did a great job um, detailing how funding is allocated by the state and how the district uses the funds, and you just saw all that today. Um, and then they just showed us the budget shortfalls that are just um, fundamentally built into the state formulas. And I was really surprised by that, um, even though I thought I had a pretty decent understanding before I was on this committee. Um, now, there will always be a chorus of people that believe that the district, the schools, and the teachers can be more efficient and can do better with what they have. And although I do believe in that call for efficiency, I also know <clears throat> that a ream of paper can be a valuable commodity to a teacher. I learned that Higley is doing a great job with the resources that they do have but that the structural funding problem cannot be solved by efficiency. The override is funding is critical to sustaining the success of our students. As an infrastructure nerd, I looked very carefully at the capital projects that were proposed by the staff to make sure that they were needs and not wants. The safety improvements, the large facility maintenance improvements, and the transportation proposal are all needs that will improve the educational environment for our students. Um, so without these, the experience will degrade for them. And that is what convinced me that we should recommend the bond package as it was presented today, even though I was initially skeptical. Um, and lastly, I just want to state that um, we have a responsibility to convey to the voters what will happen with these additional funds, but just as importantly, what will not happen with them and what will be cut. Um, because that course of efficiency will say that you can do it without them, and that and a silent response will make their view the default that the voters have to be moved off of in order to support these proposals. Now, I know that the district cannot lobby on behalf of any of these things, but you have to put out the straightforward message of what will happen and what will have to be cut in an educational way, not in a lobbying way, 
just so that the voters can be informed and have an educational decision before them with facts and not conjecture and not opinions by others. I had a great time. Um, I, I will say Tyler needs a, um, a little bit of time management. An hour long meeting turned into two and a half hours. We all, but it was because we dove into these, into these issues. Um, we even lamented the state funding and, and um, spent a few moments um, wishing we could fix our state, but then we had to focus back on continuing for Higley. And I feel like we got there as a committee. It was a great experience. And thank you for, for having this committee and for the suggestion that Tyler put out there and, and for, for going forward with it. So thank you. Good evening, I'm Vanessa Shepard. I'm a wife, I'm a mom, I'm a friend. I can sometimes be somebody you might not like when I'm coming around doing inventory. But I am privileged to be able to say that I live in this community, I work in this community with the finance department, and I'm the property control specialist. I see things, I'm underfoot, and people don't even see me. I hear conversations, and I get the feel. It's not just about the job. I get to feel the people. I get to go into the classroom and see the students. We volunteer for breakfast and lunch duty. I think everyone here at Higley is dedicated to the real main root of why we're here is our students. And just like we run our homes, just like we run our businesses, we can't run them with love and just air. It doesn't work like that. So my role involves maintaining accurate records, staying in compliance, performing moderate to complex clerical and technical accounting functions related to property management and inventory control of the district's valuable assets. But one thing I learned about community and the reason I joined the Citizens Committee was because I grew up in a community that worked together. We, if you didn't have milk, your neighbor had milk and you had corn, you swapped it out. That, that, those are old school values that never die. And my parents actively participated in our community. My father owned his own construction company where he helped to design and build homes, schools, and fire departments. My mother was employed by the Richland County School District for over 20 plus years and retired as the director of parent education. So choosing to get involved felt natural. Being on the committee has afforded me an opportunity to learn more about school funding and land use. It's afforded me an opportunity to have a voice in decision making. It's shown me where to lend my talents and expertise with the children and to serve this community. Speaking honestly, my overall experience with the committee and the group left me with many emotions. Sometimes I went home sad because we seemed to be losing sight of our mission. Many of us were looking in the rearview mirror instead of using that big windshield in front of us to guide us to the bright and promising future ahead. I was so ignorant and unaware to what an override was, what a bond was prior to becoming part of the group, prior to coming to this committee and coming to the school district, attending the ASVO and the, the continuing education workshops and all of the things we have at our fingertips that give us a better insight on why we do what we do. I took advantage of everything. I sometimes paid for my own classes just so I can understand something. And you can't go into something not knowing what it is. So I did my research on what a bond was, what an override was, and I did. I thought I knew what it meant to have a budget or a school budget, but I quickly got a love tap of revelation that is not as simple as we think. I did. I'm going to be brave and say I did vote for both the override and the bond because I feel that if you're going to take a risk and you want to ask for something, don't ask for a little bit, ask for everything because you might end up getting it. So I have seen for myself what a difference it makes to be involved, have dedicated employees that champion each other, 
and have a sound financial plan and program with a guru like Tyler Moore at the helm. I am not just saying this because I work with him. I say this because I trust him. I trust you. I trust the people in this room. I trust the people in the classroom. And yeah, there was a lot of opposition. And sometimes you walked out of those meetings and you're like, boy, I don't know if I want to sit next to this person in the restaurant. We might not like each other anymore. But then it, it made me really think that we got big brains. We got a lot of power. We got a lot of smart people. And just because we don't agree don't mean we can't come to a unified decision that supports the, the thing that is the best. And when I say Tyler is a guru, and as y'all can see, we had 25 pages of data, okay? I saw some shifting legs, I saw some, <laughs> but an overall presentation like this takes a smart person. It takes a person who loves numbers. And that gentleman over there, he loves some numbers, OK? And to break it down on a layman's term, I got all the statistics. We got all the yays and nays. You know, we got everybody up in an uproar about why this or that. But when it comes down, and, and, and what it all boils down to is that Tyler, he's an expert at finance. He's real respected by his peers and his colleagues. I've seen this for myself. And I also believe that his moral compass is navigating this district in a direction in which we can leverage the district finance to give our students the best. And that's why I'm here. I like being the best. I got a feeling everybody in this room likes being the best. And Higley is the best. Before my family and I moved here, we've seen Arizona. I'm from South Carolina. I've traveled a good little piece of the U.S. in my career with Bank of America over 20 years. I spent a lot of time on the road. I've seen a lot of states, and I've seen what people do. But I love being the best, so that's why I chose you. I'm glad I'm here. I'm glad we disagree because that lends to an opportunity so that we can agree. So I encourage us to unify, to support HUSD so that our children can see what it looks like to be the best and what it takes to be the best. And sometimes being the best means that we don't always agree, but we're unified in the effort to make things better and the best all the time. So thank you for allowing me to be in this community. Thank you for allowing me to speak this evening. And thank you, the board, for making the decision that I know that you all are going to make, because it's always going to be in the best interest of Higley. Thank you. Next time I'm going to review her speech before. <laughs> Um, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions from the board. President Anderson, Mr. Moore, now we have seven schools that are below 60% capacity. What are the chances of doing redistricting in order to provide more space for, for instance, like, HTA, which is close to, close to Williams Field, to be able to do some sort of redistricting and be able to provide HTA space for our Williams Field students? I mean, that, uh, President Anderson, Vice President Van Hook, that is not something we have entertained, um, just because I, I don't think the sheer capacity of moving the entire school of HTA across our elementaries that are not in that neighborhood uh, are appropriate for our families who utilize the schools as a neighboring neighborhood school. So, but that, that is not something we have researched, but we can certainly look into. Yeah, I'm just, I'm concerned because the fact that we have seven schools below 60% 60, 60 or below capacity, physical capacity, we need to consider what our options are 
when it comes to being able to redistrict financially i mean that that's got to be something that we we do consider um we've got i mean the space the the funding for um water power like everything that we're paying for these facilities is it a possibility that we can consolidate um another i just lost my train of thought Sorry, go. I, I completely lost my train of thought. Go ahead if you have other questions. President Anderson, um, along those same lines, Mr. Moore, um, you know, looking and seeing that we're capturing just under 50% of our own students. Obviously, that talks about our competition, um, that families are, are getting needs met elsewhere. Um, is there still ongoing conversation about um, specializing certain areas to increase capture rates and looking at um, perhaps some magnet schools kind of along the lines that Ms. Van Hook was talking about without leaving an empty building? The maintenance on an empty building becomes horrible. Um, it, it really actually becomes very expensive to maintain an empty building. Um, and I don't think any of our neighborhoods want empty buildings. But is, is that ongoing conversation of looking at some type of magnet schools to increase, um, to increase our capture rate? Yes, yeah, so President Anderson, uh, Board Member Reese, um, I know I, I've been with um, discussion with Ms. Lindsay um, and looking at some of our elementary schools um, in terms of other magnet programs. I know we've done, um, Ms. Lindsay has done tours um, and some of our elementary principals have done tours. Um, and so uh, those are initiatives that we are researching and still looking into. Um, they require a lot of man hours. Um, if you look around this, we're down uh, individual in our in our admin team, and that being a superintendent. Ms. Sherry Rich has been doing a great job, but we have been um, spread thin yeah. in this year. And so, uh, but that is something that we've been um, ongoingly um, researching and looking at potential options um, to implement in the upcoming fiscal years. Well, and some of these items that you touched on, I mean, they are, bleachers sound like nothing, but if you've been to these schools during events, there's huge safety risks um, that they're overcrowded. They scare me, actually. Um, and so these are our needs um, for some safety for our students, for our visitors. Um, and in addition, we are in competition with our neighboring districts. So. Um, while it may not seem like a need to one, it is a need to another. It is interest. Um, I'm just, if anyone's been out there and has seen Hamilton's gym, I mean, I, I get we're not as big as them, but wow, they have like, I think there's three courts back to back inside. I, I, you'll get lost. I'm not asking for that. I'm asking for us to be able to house our student body. So, um, and then have the opportunity to create revenue. I know some of our schools cannot hold certain competitions that are fundraising um, because we're not big enough. So um, that eliminates certain activities from that as well. So, um, I just, as long as we're still having the ongoing conversation on how to utilize space, I know that's important. Um, and understanding demographics, there's ebbs and flows. And so we may, we everywhere has seen a decrease in uh, K-3 education since COVID. And it's going to come back up. 
And so most neighborhoods turn over every seven years. And so you'll be capturing more kids. And so we, it's there. I think we need to, there is some things we can look at to continue to, to better capture our own students, but I think the potential is there. Yeah, and I just want to point out, uh, President Anshin, remember he said, I think the representation of this proposal reflects the, the current um, kind of needs in, in, of our district, right? We understand there's competition, but we, myself and Gustavo, our director of facilities and maintenance, um, really looked at what our needs were. We tried to internalize um, what our, we, we understand, we, we, ho we holistically understand there's competition, but um, yeah, I don't know how, you know, obviously that can be decided on, on that can be influencing somebody's individual perception, but I think we looked holistically at what our needs were in terms of our high schools being outgrown of the current facilities, and, and that's where a lot of the project proposals stem from. Well, and I think, too, it's also, it t you have to understand some of the history. Like you said, we went through hyper-growth. A lot of our schools were built by SFB, which were bare minimum. Their, their items are coming, if not past their lifespan. Um, and like you said, we've kind of band-aid them. But at the same time that these were aging schools that would have needed those maintenance and repairs is one, when SFB quit funding anything, and two, when we started losing, um, the state started taking money back from the district. From they started taking capital. And I'm, the way they phrased it is that they were... They were only uh, gonna, the reduction was only gonna be 90% or um, things like that. So the time we had, we would have been ideal and proactive in taking care of some of these things, that funding wasn't available. We found ways to band aid it. Other things have, have come up, and these things need attention. So um, understanding that when they would have or should have gotten attention, we weren't getting the funding for that. So um, we had to find ways to try and get through. Mr. Moore, I have a quick question about the, the committee. Three people didn't vote. Did they attend all of the meetings and then just at the end chose not to vote or? Yeah, President Anderson, uh, Member Schultz, I think it's, uh, the note to my time management skills. <laughs> um, we, you know, several meetings went past six, to, you know, and, and so I think individuals had obligations. Mm -hmm. um, at the last meeting, uh, we had to, you know, I think that attended me and then had to leave and before the vote can take place. And so that's what those three um, represent. One did miss the final meeting, but two, one was online, didn't stay on until the vote, and one I think left early. And so. Thank Again, you for I, clarifying I got some that. work to do on my time management. I'm sure there was a lot of things to manage <laughs> during that time. President Anderson, Mr. Moore, whose mistake was it to put the bleachers on the wrong side? Whoever built the school, I don't know, Ms. Reese has made, you have more history than me. It was the builders. So why didn't we go back to them and have them fix it um, has the time lapsed to where we can force them to fix it? I think President Anderson, Vice President Van Hook, I think uh, you know, after the district signed off on those invoices, that we, you know, somebody took ownership to, to obligate that, you know, to authorize building them in that place. And so I, I, I don't, we don't have really any authority to go back and, and hold that builder accountable for something the district approved and signed off on. So unfortunately, and I don't think we have any options in regards to holding the builder accountable to change those. So at the time of approving, the district knew that the bleachers were on the wrong side and still approved it? Or okay, we just speak. didn't catch it? I, I have no context of, of that time in which those were approved and who approved those. Do you so. know? I Can, don't. I don't know who... Vice would President have gone through Hook. that. I can, and I can look into that to try to figure at it out. Yeah, I mean, I, I wish that we, I mean, now it's, it's too late, obviously, but it would, um, 
And, and do you know when it was done? It, it, well, when Williams Field was built, it, that's how it was built. Oh, so, okay. I, I mean, it was that they so were it on. After the it, it, right. It, those are the originals. And so, um, and perhaps at the time, whoever signed off on it, that school wasn't nearly as big as it is now. And so they could have looked at it and said, hey, I mean, this, it's backwards, but the school's got to open and we're ready to go and we don't have enough students to fill it now anyway. So, and I'm just saying, I, I wasn't there, but that, that's a potential because the school has grown tremendously since then. Okay, thank you. Also, uh, President Anderson, Mr. Moore, correct me if I'm wrong, even if it were placed in the appropriate location as far as the away being on the opposite side, we would still need the larger bleachers for what we currently have as far as capacity, right? Like, I mean, because they would have been the same size, they just would have been on the opposite sides of the field, right? That's correct. The uh, President Anderson, member Wade, that it, the proposal addresses two things, moving the bleachers into the correct side, but also increasing the capacity of the bleachers to hold the student body and the current needs of the, of the school. I just want to make a comment that I, I really um, liked what Mr. Brown said, um, and he was very straightforward, and, and also in what he said about um, having a straightforward message and how important that is, um, should we decide to vote to move forward with this, of what will happen and what will, won't happen, and I appreciate that, and appreciate um, your insight as well. No, you... Thank you, President Anderson. Uh, um, some things that I am I'm grateful for with respect to your presentation as well as the individuals from the community, uh, the committee that spoke out today. Um, some things that I know to be true uh, is it's very difficult uh, to understand the way finance is set up for education in this state. And I recognize both as you know, a member of this board, a former teacher who taught in this district, but as a parent and taxpayer, um, that it often feels frustrating that we have to make these types of requests. Um, the way that the state structured it and its reasonings um, are designed so they don't have to have the responsibility. Um, and I can understand why they would like to do that because these are not easy conversations to have, but it puts a pretty big burden uh, on us to do so. And that's, that's a very difficult space to be in. So I appreciate how we you know, hope to go forward and, and maintain the ability to try to educate individuals on what that means and why this is a necessity. Because if you are angry at this mere existence, then get angry and, and tell our state legislatures of these types of things. Um, we've made several mentions of the fact that we are losing enrollment, which is true, and competition, uh, and some of that enrollment loss from COVID. Um, there are other things that are at play there with respect to vouchers. Um, some things that are new that I think are also important to understand because a lot of our facilities focus is on high school later years. Uh, I think it's very easy for individuals to homeschool if you don't have a background in education at an elementary level, but then as your kids get older and the needs of that, those subjects and everything else, that's part of the reason why they come back in middle and high school and why those numbers continue to increase because there's a lot of things that are there, not only sports, clubs, academics, and I recognize that homeschool kids still have the option to do those things, but there are subjects that you just, you're not an expert in everything and that's really hard to do and provide and so, I think things to keep in mind that are important is as all of these things are true and we have all of these new builds and more new builds that are coming, one of the things that people do is shop for and the look of things, the offerings that we have is what makes people come here. We have great academics and we have routinely had them and that's part of the reason that people come here, but not everybody is academic centered. 
I was a former AP teacher, and I'm not academic-centered. I think there are other things that public education can provide and do for the community. And for those individuals who also don't have students and struggle sometimes to see the benefits, our property values increase, and it makes it easier for us to be able to do these things. So it's, yes, a benefit to the students, and ultimately that is the responsibility of us here on the board, here as a district, is to be here for our students and do what is right for them and in their best interest. But for those individuals who may feel as if they don't see the benefit of this, I, I challenge you to take a step back and look at some of the things that not only the schools provide for the community, but how that reflects on your neighborhood, your home value, and the desire for individuals to be here, because that all plays a part into why these offerings, which I'm very grateful to the committee for, for doing, and I recognize that it is a risk, but I, again, you, you miss the shots that you don't take kind of deal, and so I think it is important to keep that in mind as we go forward. So thank you for that. President Anderson, Mr. Moore, um, I, you talked about uh, or relocating the tennis courts at uh, Higley. Does that mean um, we would then have to stop paying um, the church at that point, too, for parking? For parking? And I can't remember the amounts for the church parking. No, you're relocating the tennis courts at... We're relocating the tennis courts at... Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, then never mind. Ignore me. But I thought... Didn't we all... Do we all... We use the church. Okay. I was like, yes. Sorry, I thought it was... Thank you. President I thought Anderson I was Schultz. right. Yeah. They just tried to hold on. We just, recently, just we just recently adopted an agreement with um, the church across from Williamsfield. But uh, moving transportation would then open up more parking spaces um, to allow for students to then, yeah, to sever that agreement and then um, move those individuals onto the campus. The church parking lot at uh, over here, across from Higley, um, that the church, I think, in, in kind um, lets us use that lot. So. Um, we do not pay for that, so. Okay. But they would have to stop crossing the street, so that's safety, right? Well, yeah, you that's get them all on the one, yeah. Okay. Thank you. I just had a question just for clarification. Uh, regarding the workout area um, for the football, what's it called? Practice. There it is. Um, is equipment going to be included with that, or is it strictly just building? Currently, at this time, it's just, uh, President Anderson, just building space. We just need additional space for um, locker room capacity um, uh, to help assist with supervision, having students have their own space, um, and giving a space for each one of our programs. Currently, there's a lot of shared locker room space, um, and so, um, expanding that to open up um, to meet the capacity needs of, of, of those programs who have greatly increased since that was built in 2010. Um, yeah. Thank you. And for the bleachers, I just want to clarify, it's new bleachers, not expanding upon the bleachers that are already in place. Is that correct? Or has that even been decided? It would be new bleachers at this time, that off the top of my head, yeah. I, we can look into the opportunity of expanding to potentially save some money, um, but I know the age of those bleachers. Um, we've had to do warranty work on those, uh, especially, especially at Higley High. Um, uh, so I would have to, I can't answer that off the top of my head, but we would look at options to save money, obviously. Um, but in my opinion, I think they would be replaced uh, due to the age of them. Yeah, I was just wondering what, what you were talking about, if it's one or the other. Are there any other questions or comments regarding this? Okay, thank you. Thank you for those that came and spoke tonight, um, and thank you for the committee members that, that went and, and gave um, a, apparently more than an hour um, each time <laughs> to learn and participate and give input. We really appreciate it. Um, all right. <laughs> So that concludes our information items. We're going to head over to the action items. In action item 7.1, we're going to uh, vote to approve uh, the Citizen Committee's recommendation. Are there any questions or comments before we make a vote? And, and if, if that's, I don't know if that slide is going back up. Can, that was the 15% for the override and then a bond for 83 million. 
Yeah, President Anderson, the, the recommendation from the committee was to um, put on the ballot a renewal, a continuation of the 15% MNO override and um, option 2A, which was the $83.1 million bond proposal. And again, uh, as I mentioned, this is just to accept the recommendation of the community to give me direction to discuss with the attorneys um, to bring forth a resolution to officially approve it. So tonight, again, you, you, you're not putting anything on the ballot. You, you're just giving, this is giving me some direction to bring forth a, an official resolution to then uh, vote on to put that on the ballot, so. Is there any discussion? Okay. Um, I motion that the governing board approve the citizens committee recommendation as presented in option 2A. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? I'd like to explain my vote, please. Um, attending the committee meeting was enlightening but it also brought light to some troubling issues. It's disheartening to see certain members push for a bond regardless of the recommendation by high ground or dissenting opinions. Many of the committee members showed up to push for a bond no matter what was presented. A member at the last board meeting said that the top priority for the bond was teacher pay and that is false. The top priority for the community was safety and security. She also told the committee at one of the meetings that if you, aren't working, uh, if you aren't willing to work on the messaging, then you shouldn't be a part of it. I'm not sure what messaging that is. The disrespectful treatment of Mr. Bender from some committee members was appalling at the last meeting. From one's outburst to another's dismissive gestures, and at one point, Marty, President Anderson, and I thought one member was going to hit Marty. Another member, had to use her hand as a gavel to stop the outburst. It's clear that the civility and respect was severely lacking. Why would any community member want to take part in such a committee in the future when this behavior is tolerated? Marty merely presented the survey data and his recommendations based on that data. Meanwhile, no attempt was made to correct misinformation being spread by other members. Instead, the only person using the data provided was Gaslit. The tactics by high ground, including deceptive survey questions, were concerning as well. I actually got the survey call and will tell you that based on the wording used for those questions were, mere, were very deceptive. If these questions were asked a different way, they would have gotten different results. Their survey showed 45.8% think that K2 through 12 education in our community is heading in the wrong direction. High Ground claimed that this dissatisfaction stems solely on national news, which undermines the issues within our state and our district, including ideological conflicts and many other issues affecting our students and families directly. One member claimed that parents are pulling their kids out due to aesthetics. Parents are not pulling their kids out um, due to superficial reasons such as aesthetics, but because of fundamental disagreements with the direction of education. And I know this because I have spoken to many parents who are on waiting lists for charters and private schools. Blindly approving proposals without considering long-term consequences jeopardizes financial stability and public trust. We've all seen the news regarding the superintendent that we have hired. That should be a warning to all of us as to what could happen when board members rubber stamp everything that is pre presented to them instead of asking tough questions. We have, a board, we have a board member worried about $8 business cards, but not the millions that are rubber stamped by this board without question. I said at the last board meeting that we can't make decisions based on the hopes that a bond and override passes and was told that if Mr. Moore didn't feel confident that he wouldn't present those, that option, but at the same time say that if it doesn't pass, cuts will have to be made. For me, cutting programs for children is not an option. 
That's why kids are here, and I've said this before. Transparency in spending and prioritizing needs over wants is a must. I've always discussed that we need to look at budget reductions because we have to go back to functioning without SR funds. The district has made permanent staffing decisions with temporary funds. We need to look at that as well. We are to pay approximately $150,000 for the election. To date, we have paid $15,000 for the survey. It will cost us uh, $750 per question on the ballot, $13,600 to Applied Economics, and I'm not sure how much we'll be paying for Stifle. So not counting Stifle, we have already paid out $30,000 before we even consider a bond. The true implications of a bond and override must be communicated honestly to the community. While touted that an override is not a tax increase, in reality, it is a prolonged tax burden. We must uphold honesty, integrity, and accountability in all of our actions. And with that, my vote is no. Okay, motion carries four to one. All right, moving on to action item 7.2, tentative approval of the fiscal year 2025 capital outlay budget. Any questions, comments, discussions? Okay. Um, I noticed that equipment was listed on here twice, uh, furniture, fixtures, and equipment. So one's under educational services and one, one's under, under schools. Do we know why that is? Yeah, President Anderson, Member Van Hook, um, the highlighted section represents the department in which that budget is under. So the educational service department has a instructional aid, furniture, fixture, and equipment budget, as well as each one of our, um, under our school budgets, each one of our schools has a furniture, fixture, and equipment budget. So. Um, the reason it's listed twice is because it's under two different departments. Um, each department has a budget for that purpose. Okay. And um, the instructional aid, um, what would fall into, under that category? Yeah, so that, uh, President Anderson, Vice President Van Hook, um, that is utilized by the Educational Service Department to, to provide uh, supplemental uh, resources for our, our DLI programs, um, our traditional programs, et cetera. Um, those um, uh, resources are annual obligations that the Educational Service Department has to procure um, annually. And so um, those are supplemental resources to support those programmatic schools. And, and this is based on funding we have currently, correct? Yeah. These are budget numbers based on the estimated budget, um, capital budget um, for next fiscal year. Great. And Thank this you. Is, so much. Yeah, I'm sorry. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? No? Okay. I motion that the governing board tentative, tentatively approve the fiscal year 2025 capital outlay budget. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Did I hear your name? Yeah. Oh, oh, okay. I'll, uh, so five ayes, motion carries five to zero. <laughs> um, I, I'd actually like a motion, uh, to make a motion to table this item. Um, and if I can explain um, why that is. Um, Are you talking about 7.3? Yes. Okay. Um, I have another statement written. Um, so given my experience in the health freedom world, I've been deeply involved in advocating for protecting our citizens from potential health risks. One of those risks is posed by electromagnetic fields emitted by source, sources like cell towers. These concerns are critical to address, especially when considering placing such towers on school grounds. There's significant data indicating that exposure to electromagnetic fields from cell towers can lead to various symptoms, including headaches, fatigue, sleep disturbances. Additionally, 
um, there are well-founded concerns regarding the potential long-term effects of radiofrequency radiation on health, with some studies suggesting possible links to increased cancer risk, notably brain cancer. Furthermore, research has indicated potential neurological impacts such as alterations in brain activity and cognitive functions, as well as effects on uh, reproductive health. It's especially considering, uh, concerning considering the vulnerability of children whose developing bodies may be more susceptible to the effects of RF radiation. Beyond health concerns, residents nearby may view the tower as undesirable, potentially leading to decrease in property values in the area. Moreover, the risk of electromagnetic interference with the electronic devices within the schools, such as technology, communication systems, and medical equipment. A couple weeks ago, two, re two residents in Washington won a right to intervene in a lawsuit against AT&T in federal court regarding a 65-foot cell tower going, back near the, um, going up near their home. The claimant is 100% reliant on a pacemaker, and his exposure to radio frequency ra radiation can interfere with his pacemaker. In 2022, when AT&T and Verizon rolled out 5G, they were instructed by the White House to hold off on the rollout within two miles of all airports due to the possibility of dangers on pl um, to planes. Given these risks and concerns, the safety and health of our school community must remain a top priority. And the potential risk associated with cell towers on school grounds outweigh any financial gains. I can provide further research to anyone that would like to see it. There are over a thousand studies related to health risks from these towers. This is not communicated, this was not communicated to our community. No public input was considered. Snuck into consent agenda, not necessarily stuck that you guys did it on purpose, but it was in the consent agenda just to get a 5-0 and o vote and, and move along. And then incoming emails today from 8 a.m. at least until 4.30 p.m. were blocked from community members, and we were not able to see any of those emails that were coming in. I would encourage that we have, um, I would encourage that we have a town hall and listen to our community and hear the evidence that is out there on the harmful effects it has. Our community deserves to voice their concerns and, and be able to communicate to us whether they want this or not. The people that live around the school should be able to voice their concerns if they want those near their home, when, want it near their home. I'm shocked to learn that we already have two towers at two other schools, which I'm sure was passed in consent by previous boards without any question or public input. This isn't being transparent. Why do these companies target schools, one might question because districts typically will put money before lives and we need to consider the health impact that this has on our students, our teachers, our families that live around these schools. So I beg you, I urge you to allow us to table this. Let's have a town hall, allow the public to come in and speak and share their concerns. I even worked HB 2636 in 22 to get this legislation passed that if its cell tower is going to go anywhere near a residential area that 80% of residents had to vote on it. And unfortunately, it did not move further um, due to random reasons. But um, I, I just, I would just ask that I'm, I'm not asking you to vote yes, I'm not asking you to vote no, but let's, let's allow a voice from our community. Uh, Mr. Moore, if this were to be tabled, would, would there be implications on anything as far as building or contract purposes? Uh, President Anderson, no, I, we have not, nothing has started in terms of construction or um, okay. the process to move forward. Um, I do want to note, though, 
just a couple things. The, all the emails that we received um, today, uh, I, I, we do, yeah, some were blocked due to the, the email that was coming from, but all of those emails were not um, community members or parents of our district. In addition, Queen Creek recognizes the district as a political entity under AZ law, and Queen Creek does not require a zoning permit. Um, I, th I think the legislation that you were working on would, would have required that, but currently um, does not require a zoning permit at the site of the cell tower set back more than 300 feet from a resident, which this proposal is. Um, but at the same token, Ms. Anderson, it would not impact. Um, we can continue to delay this. As you can see, the original agreement in which I found was not board approved in which I'm bringing tonight was in 2020. The amendment that I've been working on which I thought was off the original agreement, um, is what I was asking for tonight to uh, proceed with um, the cell tower. But we can continue to push that off um, at the board's request, so. President Anderson, um, Mr. Moore, um, I do know there was community members that whose emails did not come through. And even the, the few emails that did come through, even if they're not immediate community members, these are state taxpayers whose money goes into the state funds who, and, and that money is put out to all the districts within the state. So whether they live here, the information that they were providing is valuable and is necessary for everybody to be able to see. Um, so, so the excuse that they're not community members is, I mean, I don't know. I it's it's it shouldn't be looked at that way. Um, we should value every email that comes in um, with information, and the fact that after 8 a.m. these emails were blocked is extremely concerning. Um, and I don't know. I don't know what the reasoning was. The last email was received at 7:45, and then it just completely stopped. We were getting other emails but nothing related to, to the cell tower. Um, and, and I did have people calling me going, it, it's, my emails are getting kicked back, I can't. And they literally, one guy tried from you know, 7.30 up until 4.30. Um, as, as I pulled up, he was calling, he goes, I still can't send it. So um, based on that alone, I think that we need to um, allow for public comment and um and and i urge you to be able to allow that because we're here for our community and we need to be able to hear their voice president anderson uh, board member van hook i think um a couple things i would like to to address as far as your statements overall i received emails all day um so I do recognize that these types of things happen, but I think it's important at least publicly to express that, that some of these issues may be in certain specific instances, depending on all kinds of things. I mean, emails routinely go down. We get, we get hmm, emails <laughs> about the fact that email is down or something to that effect, um, and notifications, et cetera. Um, so I, I received them all day um, from all different types of individuals. I also... Um, struggle with the statement that because these individuals are not part of our um, constituency that they have the same merit, especially when your concerns, which I, I hear and are valid, and I'm not saying that we can't table it or that I wouldn't support a table, um, but you're also talking about it, the importance of hearing from our community members on how they feel about it. Somebody who lives in Tucson or Prescott is irrelevant to that specific conversation. And a good portion of the emails I got today were not even in Maricopa County. Um, that matters in terms of how you're feeling or how you're talking about things. I also think it's important for us as we progress and if we continue to talk about this, get more information. None of us are scientists. And so when it comes to looking at studies to determine whether or not certain studies are valid or the validity of some of these things, or when you look at some of the studies that were sent to us, didn't have their data. 
a lot of the stuff that was sent to us is these are the things that I fear. Here is the the evidence, but there there was no explanation on where they got this data, how many people they got it from, especially when you're looking at things like cancers. I mean, going outside and taking a deep breath in our state is not great. We have massive amounts of smog leads to beautiful sunsets, but there are reasons that we have high rates of asthma and those types of things. So yes, I do believe that it matters and I'm willing to have these conversations and getting that information, but I think it's important to keep some of those things in mind as we progress. I also don't think it's uh, fair or genuine to say that our district is putting finance over the safety of our students. Um, I just don't. Looking at the things that we have done, the decisions that we have made, I, I don't see that to be a true statement. Um, and so from my perspective and the things that I'm doing and the things that I see routinely, I feel strongly that Higley routinely makes decisions that are for the safety and well-being of our students. And that is something that we always keep at the forefront. Uh, that matters. I also think when you look at finances, we just talked about proposing a board or a bond. Um, you know, if those types of things pass, then we don't have to look for other avenues to look at ways in which we can get some funds to offset certain things. So again, I'm, I'm willing to have some of these conversations as we progress or look forward, but I, I think it's important to be reflective of how we paint a picture or what we see personally and how we feel about that versus making statements uh, on behalf of others or without the full scope of information. President, President Anderson. Anderson. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, go it's ahead. It's okay. Um, Vice President Van Hook. President Anderson, I did receive the concern that they weren't, some of them weren't going through. So we have IT looking into that because I personally got a whole bunch, but then I saw some say when I would forward it, it's suspicious. So they're looking into it. And if we have information to report, We'll put it into um, status this week. So sometimes it's just somebody's address or whatever. But anyway, I wanted to follow up and tell you they are looking into it. But I got a whole bunch. I think so. also a lot of them had websites or videos, which is also part of the reason that they get yeah. filtered out to avoid phishing and those types of things. Yeah. Yeah, if it just says look at a link, then they avoid those out. I mean, we routinely get emails that say this is on hold or do you yes. want to accept this spam that sometimes don't come in that day, but tonight you might have that that you can approve it because they're not sent right away. And I did get a ton of emails myself. I even asked a question, several questions. The speaker referred to me as Trisha, but um, I did ask questions of them to get more information and receive the reply as well. And I think we all did. Um. President Anderson, um, yes, I, I did get that one. And then all the ones um, you forwarded, I had already received those. Those were during the day. Um, but to say we shouldn't consider um, uh, to board member um, Wade's response, to say we shouldn't consider people that are not within our immediate constituency. Um, I find it interesting that when we were proposing the bond committee, um, that there was a request to allow people that didn't live in our district to be able to be a bond, part of the bond committee just because their kids come here, but they don't, they live in Pinal County. Um, and we had received that email specifically from one individual um, wanting to be a part of it. So um, we can't have one way and not the other. Um, and the information that was being provided today um, is important information. And there was emails from professionals who deal with this on a daily basis that um, are physicians um, that deal with it. And I didn't say our district puts money before children. I said districts. Um, I know two weeks ago, um, there was same thing happened at, in Tucson. Um, and a neurologist spoke um, and explained how he is seeing an increase in brain cancer in children. Um, and so that is something serious that we should consider. Um, I would hate to... Um, 
have something awful happen to any one of our children or staff. Um, so to be able to take in that input um, from the community is important to me. And um, for $24,000 a year, um, yeah, I mean, it's nice to get you know money, but uh, at the detriment of our community, um, no, that's it's not worth it. Um, for me, if it was a million bucks, it wouldn't be worth it um, at the, the damage that it can cause. Um, so for right now, I am only asking that we table it, we allow a town hall, and allow our community um, to voice their concerns, um, and then we can make a decision um, after that. President Anderson. Um, well, I think, and you just even said it too, we were getting emails, some were kicked out, but it's not like all the emails regarding the situation were blocked. So it's not like people couldn't get information to us, which was how it initially sounded. But um, I, I, I do have issues receiving emails from people in Prescott, Prescott Valley, Tucson, um, where actually I, I don't know that I saw any from any of our community members like that are actually local that are in that area that uh, not even in our district. Um, clearly, there was a call to action regarding this item because our very first email regarding this item came in at 5.03 last night. And our board packet doesn't go live until 5 o'clock. So our board packet went live at 5 p.m. yesterday, and by 5.03, I was already receiving emails. So people knew it was on our board packet. There was already a call to action for us to get inundated with emails um, from people who aren't even in our area. So obviously, it, w it was sent to groups, political groups, regular groups anyway, there, whoever, there was clearly a call to action with this being on our, our board packet. Um, and if people are reaching out, you, reaching out to you directly saying, I'm trying to send you an email, um, then it, it just, I gotta wonder. But um, clearly there was a call to action with our board packet hitting at five o'clock, 503 having an email, um, about it. I'm not saying I, I wouldn't agree to table it, but um, I can't put the merit into emails I'm receiving from all over the state on a call to action um, request versus people who it's going to impact. So I, uh, like I said, I, I'm not saying I disagree with tabling it. I'm not saying that, that we can't decide something else, but, um, but there, there is a clear reason we were receiving these emails. President Anderson, Board Member Reese, um, I made a call to a friend to, to get information, and that friend obviously put out a call to action, and these are people that care about the health of children, that it doesn't matter what school it is, that they will reach out, provide information in order to save and protect the health of children. So I'm sorry that that bothers you, but the fact that these people care for, for the health of children should speak volumes and the information that they provide is also valuable. So. It's not that I put out a call to actions. Like I said, there's no reason for you to wonder. I made a phone call to a friend who then realized what was on our agenda and then put out a call to action to anybody that is involved in protecting children's health. So, um, so yeah, I, I know that there's you know, several individuals that were trying to email and their emails weren't coming through. At, at one point, somebody mentioned like 22 emails. So um, I maybe received, I don't know, maybe five, six. Yeah. 
So it, it, it wasn't coming through for me. Um, the initial one, this, this gentleman I know, the initial one, it was you, Sherry, and, um, oh my gosh, I just went blank, Tiffany, um, whose, whose emails were kick, kicked back. And then after that, everybody started being kicked back. Um, but possible my name was spelled wrong. <laughs> it is constant that my name is yeah. spelled wrong. And um, so so I don't know. But I, I, I just hope that we can at least table this for right now. And let's, let's hear our community. Let's hear what they want and what they think. And, um, and then we can vote on it another day, the next meeting. But in the meantime, allow the ability to do some sort of a town hall and hear, hear them out. Um, can I ask just a couple of thank you? Can I ask a couple of questions, Mr. Moore? Um, did we reach out to them, or did they reach out to us for this cell tower? Since I wasn't around for the origination of this agreement, um, there was other administration that signed this. Um, I do not ha know how the okay. connection got okay. made. And, um, I appreciate the map. Um, I don't understand the map. Where exactly? <laughs> So, Where exactly um, is this tower going to be? President built? Anderson, if you're familiar with Sossaman, um, I guess if you're familiar with Sossaman or Cooley, they're like for like. Um, there's a concession stand that resides kind of um, specifically in Sossaman in the middle of the campus um, in between the two fields. Um, there's a small little concession stand. So there's a light pole there. Those fields are lit. Uh, this would be placed 80 feet um, up on that light, light pole. Uh, much like our other cell towers at our Gateway and Williamsville High School. Okay. Um, I, I'm okay also with the table of this. My, um, my husband um, has a master's degree in radio frequency, um, electrical engineering. He's RFIC and um, it's over almost 30 years working with it. And in his building, in his labs, they have protocols in place. Um, there are power levels, there's frequencies with, and fre and within frequencies, and <clears throat> it has sparked communication in our household. And, and I want more information. He, he of course, has you know, started a little bit of research himself. Um, as far as the, the email, I hate to br bring that back up, but I will say, um, I... If it, you know, if it's a push for something, you know, no, I'm not, I don't really respect it, but if it's truly people, cell towers are everywhere. In fact, that's what I spent my afternoon looking, was you can Google and get to a website that'll show you all the cell towers and antennas by city. And I could see, um, we have one just right here across the street uh, on Rucker and, and Pecos, and then plenty more within our district. So if it's something that people are experiencing outside our district, and wanting to share and bring awareness. I, I absolutely um, appreciate that. Um, so I'm, I'm not gonna go in the back and forth about the emails, but I just wanted to make that statement. If it truly is something concerned because cell towers are everywhere um, and communication is now space to ground, um, uh, let, let's hear it and I'm okay with tabling it and, and getting some more information and, and hearing truly from our community if, if they would like to provide import if they would like to become more knowledgeable in this manner as well. As long as, again, and, and you say that this shouldn't hurt contracts or, or bring anything that we need to. No, President, so no, we can um, push the, I mean, it's not until the board approves, I cannot sign off on this. And so, um, yeah, we'll work with legal to push the, the date back um, if the board so chooses. So. It, it's been three years, so I think we're fine. Or four years, four years, I'm sorry. It's 2024, so I think we're okay for a slightly longer that's, time. That's very <laughs> President good. Anderson, um, I just want to say that when we did receive the email starting at 5.03, as Mrs. Reese um, pointed out, that I did think, oh, I'm missing something. You know, cell phone towers are everywhere. I did become worried. Of course, I don't want to put children at risk. Um, I did do some research. One of the things was that this causes more fires. I asked fire officials, um, and they said that is not true. Uh, <laughs> I asked uh, several fire officials, not just the one that lives in my house. Um, but, um, you know, of course we want to keep our children safe, and if it means, you know, 
doing a little extra, then that's great, uh, or that I'm happy to do that, and I'm happy to table it as well. Um, I just also wonder, you know, we do use cell phones on a daily basis, if these people that, you know, are concerned about this are also not letting their children use cell phones, because I'm guessing that that's also a big factor. I don't know, because I'm not a scientist or a doctor, um, that if that's contributing to the brain cancers that you mentioned as well. Um, but again, happy to table this um, to see if our community parents um, uh, you know, are concerned about this, especially those at Sossaman as well. And, and, and teachers and staff. President Anderson, could, your, could you share your husband's stuff with us? That'd be great, thank you. No, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Um, I second the motion. Oh, okay. I'll make them. Um, I'm. Or I thought I did. I did. So I'll, I second the motion to table. I, I think she did. Yes, did. She'd like to make a motion. I, I'll do it again. <laughs> I'd like to make a motion to table this. Second. Se uh, whatever. What number is it? Seven point three. Seven point three. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion. motion carries five to zero. I just want to say thank you so much for considering to table it. All right, thank you. Let's move, in, move on to um, 8.1, future agenda items. Do we have any requests to add to our list? I, I don't have a future agenda item, but just um, one of the speakers, uh, well, I guess I can say this right now, just one of the speakers that talked about um, the teacher times the professional de development at Williamsfield, if that's something that we can get more information on and see if that's something that our teachers are concerned about, how we are able to provide better professional de development for them. Um, Board President Anderson, Ms. Schultz. Yes, we're already working on that some because Ms. Miller's been <clears throat> working with the calendar task team and it's been coming up. So. I think we can come back and provide some more information or we can provide it in status. And so maybe initially we'll provide you an update in status and then because some individuals are requesting that it get changed for next school year. So, and that calendar is already established, but I think there's been a lot of conversation with Mr. Lotzenhauser and of course this task team with Ms. Miller. So we want to do the right thing for the kids and the teachers. So uh, team, or Mr. Lawson Hazard's gone. But Ms. Miller, could we provide a brief summary of the feedback you've been receiving in status? Um, I'll be coming to you, President Anderson, members of the board, a um, at a later date with a detailed presentation that really gives you what the calendar um, task team has been doing and how we came to the recommendation that we will be bringing forth to you to approve at a later date. But in the process, we did send out a survey that talked about that late start at the high school and, and what everyone felt would be best moving forward. Predominantly on that survey, the majority of the people that responded said that they would like to discontinue the late start Wednesdays at the high school. Um, We've spent a lot of time discussing the professional development opportunities at the high school level, and again, we'll have some recommendations for you and additional information on what we're bringing forward on that at a later date. Um, the question then was, if the, if the majority of the people are not wanting to move forward with the late start, um, would it be possible to discontinue that next year instead of waiting until the new calendars take effect in the 25-26 school year? Um, and I think that that was probably why the speaker this evening came and, and kind of put that on the table because that is something that's been talked about, not just in the calendar task team, but also when those individuals on that team are going back to their campuses at the high school level and discussing this with some of their um, colleagues and peers, that that is a, a common trend that they're getting is that they'd like to see that discontinued sooner than later. Uh, 
Sorry, Ms. Miller, is it possible, and I'm assuming you would probably already do this, um, when you give some of that info, if we can look at like how staff feels about that as well? I mean, because I worked at Williamsfield when we did this. This was so we didn't have meetings after school. Because um, so, you have like games and those types of things that other people had, clubs, stuff like that. So I'm assuming that's in there. I just was meaning like whatever's proposed in that, like where does that shift to? Um, President Anderson, board can, member Wade, I am intending to share all of the survey results with you in a graph form so you'll be able to see for that specific question. Because the buses run on a normal schedule, um, the group that we did survey for the late start was the staff. So I do have that result for you. I'm sorry, President Anderson, I think I cut you off. I just didn't want the conversation to go into too much detail since oh. it's not agendized, so I just want to make sure Absolutely. we stuck to it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you for the recommendation. Um, I just wanted to, just kidding. I move that we, <laughs> I move that we adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Motion, aye, motion carries five to zero.